Good afternoon, and welcome to the Allergy and Asthma Network's U.S. Asthma Summit 2020. I'm Tanya Winders, the President and CEO of Allergy and Asthma Network, and it is my honor and privilege to host you all this afternoon. We all know that 2020 has not looked like we expected it to do so. In fact, we expected to be gathered around the room with many of you in Phoenix, Arizona, in coordination and conjunction with the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology meeting this year. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we had to pivot, which so many of us have had to do throughout this unprecedented time. I am excited to report to you, however, that on this anniversary, sixth anniversary of our U.S. Asthma Summit, that we have our largest crowd ever gathered. We actually have over 1,500 people from across all 50 states, as well as additional provinces of Canada, U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and several other countries. As far as I can uh, determine, this is the largest virtual gathering of asthma community stakeholders. And on an annual basis, we are honored to host this event and appreciate each of you giving your time and attention today. Your lines will be on mute. However, we will have opportunities for questions and answers and in interactive um, portions of the program. So please familiarize yourself now with the control panel. The GoToWebinar control panel does have a pane where you can enter questions at any time, and we'll get to as many of those as possible as we go throughout the program. Also, if you have any technical issues, you can enter that into the chat function of the control panel. We do have technical support standing by, and I appreciate the team at Allergy and Asthma Network who have worked so diligently to prepare for today's U.S. Asthma Summit. As we get started today, um, I definitely want to thank first and foremost each and every one of you for giving of your time, for being those dedicated asthma zealots, asthma advocates in your own community, and for it working together to advance guidelines-based care for asthma. We represent over 24 million Americans living with this condition and over 300 million people across the globe. It is still the number one reason children miss school and still cost our own country upwards of $80 billion a year. And so I believe that this day each year is such a wonderful opportunity for us to gather together to really turn our focus to what is working, how we are moving the needle, and also to look at best practices and network and share from, learn from one another as we look to advance care in 2021 and beyond. So again, thank you all for joining. I also would like to thank our sponsors of today's event. Without the support of organizations that are represented here on your screen, we would not be able to host the U.S. Asthma Summit. And while U.S. Asthma Summit 2020 doesn't look like any other that we've ever participated in or hosted, we are so grateful for the continued support of organizations like the CDC, Amgen, AstraZeneca, GSK, Mylan, Novartis, and Santa Fe Genzyme Regeneron. Again, because of their support, we're all here today and, and truly we'll, we'll get to hear from the experts in the field about the latest in asthma care and also share some of the best practices that have arisen from the community over the last year. So thank you to those sponsors. So again, who is around the virtual table today? Um, we, as I said at the outset, we are very excited. We have over 1,500 attendees registered for today's event. So all the lines will be on mute until we open for the specific Q&A times with those speakers. We will ask that you actually post all questions in the control panel so that it is not uh, so unwieldy to try to field questions from 1,500 people at one time. We are fortunate that we do have all 50 states represented here at the U.S. Asthma Summit. We also have individuals from Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. When looking at the registration list, uh, I, I guess that most of us would not be surprised to learn that the largest contingency from a state is actually Texas, 
with California coming in a very close second. So we've got great representation from coast to coast with very strong uh, contingencies, over 100 people registered from both California and Texas alone. Uh, we also have individuals from our neighbors to the north, from Canada, and we're very grateful for each of you attending. I think that we have lessons to learn from across the borders for sure. And then we also have several international attendees from around the globe. And so this is becoming a more international um, and universal world that we're living in. And, and definitely uh, the U.S. Asthma Summit is reflecting that. But the bottom line is, why are we here today? What is the common bond that really does bring us together for this event every year, and especially in these times of 2020? It is to improve asthma care. And for us at the network, it is core and essential to our mission of ending the needless death and suffering due to asthma. And so we welcome you as part of the network family to come around the table today to be actively engaged, even though we're not sitting formally in a room. We hope that you will find this time informative and inspirational. We are definitely missing our typical co-host, Tracy Inger Washington, this year. Uh, I, we are still partnering with the EPA, and you'll hear from them a little bit later, but it's very hard to um, do a U.S. Asthma Summit without the passion of Tracy Washington, Inger Washington. And so um, I know that she may be listening in and, and will likely be joining us for a portion of the time today, but um, I know that many of you are also wishing that we were in the room with her infectious personality. So as we get started, our first presentation today is actually going to come from Dr. Alan Meadows on the state of asthma in the United States. Dr. Meadows is a clinical instructor of family practice and a clinical instructor of allergy at Alabama College of Osteopathic Medicine. He is a solo community-based practitioner at the Alabama Allergy and Asthma Clinic in Montgomery. He is the current president of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and the past president of the Joint Council of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. He also previously served as the chairman of the Advocacy Council of the college and on the Board of Regents of the college from 2003 to 2006. He also was the College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Speaker of the House of Delegates from 2009 to 2011. Join me in welcoming Dr. Alan Meadows. Well, hello. Um, welcome. I'm going to be talking about the state of of asthma in the United States. I'm Alan Meadows. I'm the current president of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and I'm also clinical faculty at the Alabama College of Osteopathic Medicine. And I'm located here in Montgomery, Alabama. So uh, on behalf of the college, I want to welcome you to the U.S. Asthma Summit 2020, but this one's uh, virtual. And I want to uh, thank the uh, Allergy and Asthma Network, uh, Tanya Windows Winders, for asking me uh, to participate uh, in, in the summit. It's um, I know we would, we would all like to be together uh, in, in Phoenix where we were planning to be. This uh, uh, U.S. Asthma Summit is often held in conjunction with, uh, with the college meeting and, um, and our scientific meeting is being held uh, virtually uh, a, a, as well. Um, the college is a professional medical organization of more than 6,000 allergists, immunologists, and allied health professionals. Members live and practice throughout the United States and internationally. Uh, the college fosters a culture of collaboration and congeniality in which its members work together and with others toward the common goal of patient care, education, advocacy, and research. And the theme for our meeting this year is uh, the changing practice landscape rising to the challenge. And since we were, you know, supposed to be in Phoenix, and the Phoenix is a bird that rises, you know, I suggested something about, you know, rising. And uh, it couldn't have been more appropriate for uh, for for 2020 because we we made this selection before any of us even knew what uh, coronavirus was. So um, so that's uh, where we are. So what about the state of asthma? 26.4 million Americans have been diagnosed with asthma. One in 10 children have asthma. And we're looking at over $56 billion in direct and direct costs to the healthcare system. Sadly, 
6,300 deaths annually and a 75% higher risk among African Americans and Caucasians. Now, thanks to the work of groups like the, the College uh, Allergy and Asthma Network and, and, and Better Medicines, we've seen over my time in practice, this number dropped from about 5,000 to the current three, three and a half thousand. But even one needless death is too many. Um, we're looking at 13.8 million school days missed a year. It's the number one reason why kids miss school. 14.2 million days missed of work. And even worse than that, uh, something that Michael Blaze always called was presenteeism. People are showing up for work when they don't feel like being at work, which causes decreased productivity. Sadly, despite guidelines that say everyone should be normal, three in five patients with asthma limit their physical activity. 71% misuse their inhalers, and one in five people can't afford uh, their medicines. And it's just, uh, it's a shame that things are, are this way still in the United States. So where can we move forward on this? Well, what's happening? You know, what do patients understand? You know, difficulty breathing. I, I, I like the, uh, like this, the, this, this picture, you know, someone, you know, having, having an asthma attack because of constricted airway and their air sacs filling, filling up with air. But I think a, a lot of healthcare providers don't recognize people with asthma because about half of people with asthma never have an attack. And about half either wheeze or, or, or almost never wheeze or never wheeze. So what can we do with this moving forward to understand asthma better? Well, asthma is a syndrome rather than a single disease and environmental and genetic factors affect it, but it, it doesn't reflect the heterogeneous characteristics of this disease that are observed in patient populations. So, you know, we have the environmental factors driving inflammation, which drive airway hyperresponsiveness, uh, reversal airway obstruction, and getting the symptoms that we all know of coughing, wheezing, and, and dyspnea. I'm reminded of a genetics lecture that I attended on, uh, on asthma, um, where the, the speaker was going over the, the, the genomics of asthma, and he said that one day in the not too distant future, the term asthma will be as specific as the term diarrhea. Uh, because really, asthma is not one illness. Asthma is many illnesses, just like there are many illnesses uh, that cause uh, diarrhea. So asthma pathophysiology, key components, um, inflammation, bronchial hyperreactivity, airway remodeling. Um, in the 1970s, and really even way before, uh, we sponsored on, on bronchospasm. The, those of you who can see my, my face, the little picture, look up behind my head. I, I'm actually a collector of old asthma medicines. Even as far as back as the 1700s, there were bronchodilator medicines that were available. Very prominent in the early 1900s were, were bronchodilators that people smoked. Now, there was no tobacco in these asthma cigarettes. There was tremonium, uh, which is very you know, similar to the ipratropium that we have today. But up through the 1970s and even into the mid-1980s, we were focusing on bronchospasm. By the mid to late 1980s, we had an understanding of inflammation and the role that T cells and eosinophils uh, played and the importance of, of, of anti-inflammatory treatment. By the 1990s, uh, we knew about remodeling. Now, I live in Alabama, and if you remodel your single wide into a double wide, that's a good thing. Uh, but um, remodeling in asthma isn't a good thing. In Alabama, we use the term scarring. And then the, the, the present, we, we see the diagram here of all the interactions between the interact, uh, interleukins and the T cells. And so for the remainder of my time, we're gonna have a lesson on molecular biology so that we can all, no, I'm just kidding guys. We're, we're, not, we're, not, <laughs> we're not gonna do that. This is just, just for an illustration here. So uncontrolled asthma, still a huge impact on children. Um, between 50 and 70% limit their activity, have missed school in the last year, symptoms in the past four weeks, or had a sudden severe uh, attack. And this is work done uh, by Brad Chips and Joe Spahn in the um, Journal of, uh, of Asthma. But again, despite numerous guidelines that say that everybody should be normal, we're still seeing this uh, in the United States today. So how is asthma control measured? Is it measured by lung function? So a lot of uh, healthcare providers would manage it. Daytime symptoms, waking up at night. How often you use your quick relief inhaler or nebulizer? Patient self-reported control. Um, 
Now, before COVID, if we were doing this live, and clearly this was before COVID, uh, we were doing this live, typically if I was in an intimate setting, I would step behind the lectern and, and walk up to someone and shake their hand. Of course, you can't do that now with COVID and say, how are you doing? And the person would respond, fine. You know, patient self-reported control may not be the best way to do things because our patients have learned how to answer our questions correctly. And that's why some objective measures like an asthma control test can be helpful on top of asking questions. Miss school or work, good measure of asthma control. How well are we functioning in life? Are the patients satisfied with care? Utilization of, of healthcare resources, direct or indirect measures of inflammation. All these go into the milieu uh, of, of asthma control. And asthma control is a central goal in evidence-based guidelines uh, concerning the management of asthma. However, evaluating control during clinical visits is, is, uh, is variable and vulnerable to recall bias as a result of retrospective uh, assessment of systems. And really, asthma control is, is different to each ob observer. So to the patients, and this is right out of the 07 NILBH guidelines, no symptoms that interfere with normal lifestyle, no exacerbations, normal quality of life, no school or work miss, no side effects. Boy, I really wish that those were the goals of my patients. To the caregivers, able to get to school, no interference with sleep. You know, at least several times a year, when I'm talking to caregivers and, and, and patients about what their goals are, that the parents feel like the asthma is under control because they haven't been to the emergency department in the last 12 months. And it's like, man, there's a lot of education that we need to do here to kind of raise that expectation a little bit. To the primary care provider, few exacerbations, no unscheduled visits, no admissions, maintain normal peak flows. To the respiratory specialist, no symptoms, should be normal. Maintenance of lung function, few exacerbations, no exacerbations, decreased airway hyperresponsiveness and decreased inflammations. To regulatory authorities, we're talking about people like the FDA here, improvement in morning peak flow, improvement in FEV1, symptom scores, and key quality of life. To the healthcare plan, how much did it cost? Have you been to the hospital? The emergency room and drug cost. And you know, there's no right or wrong answer about how we define asthma control, but I think the first step in defining asthma control is to understand that all the stakeholders have a different idea about what asthma control is. So the goals of asthma management, and this is from the 2017 GINA guidelines, symptom control, change, obtain good control of symptoms and maintain normal activity levels and for risk reduction to minimize the risk of exacerbations, fixed airflow limitation, and medication side effects. But achieving these goals requires a partnership between the patient and their healthcare providers. Start off by asking the patient about what their goals are. Communicate with them. If their goals are to stay out of the emergency department, good communication strategies are essential about getting them to be more uh, introspective about maybe there could be a better standard than that. Consider the healthcare uh, system, medication availability, cultural and personal preferences and healthcare literacy. I give out written instructions to everyone, but if they can't read, what good does it do? Maybe we need to have some, some picture things that they go. Medication availability. You know, a lot of healthcare providers, when they're looking at prescribing the medicines, they look at the good effects and the side effects. But really, there's a, a third leg uh, to that chair is, is if, they, if it's a great medicine with few side effects, but they can't afford it. Um, what good uh, is, it, is, it going to, uh, is it going to do them? And um, a, a lot of times in, in the health system uh, nowadays to you know, keep the price down, we're having silly things like copay or accumulator cards where the medicine may cost $300 a month, but the manufacturer supplies a coupon, the coupon has a limited life, and the hope is that they'll meet their deductible. But now a lot of uh, insurance plans with the permission of our federal government are making them pay that copay twice. The insurance company pays the deductible twice and the, uh, and the patient. I, I, I don't think that that's right. So control-based asthma management cycle. You make a diagnosis, get symptoms under control, assess risk factors, including looking at lung function, look at inhaler technique and adherence, and ask the patients what their preference is. Inhaler technique is a big one. One, one study shows that as many as 80% of adults use an inhaler technique that delivers no medicines to their lungs. What I do for my patients to shake them up, I take an inhaler and puff it in my mouth and then under my arm and I says it's all the same. Adherence. Adherence rates are still, patients fill on average two to four controller inhalers a year when they're supposed to be filling 12 a year. 
So then we look at that and adjust treatment. You know, a lot of times when I'm designing a treatment plan, I'm assuming that if I'm really doing good, they're gonna do about half what I, uh, what I ask them to, to do. So then we um, review the response, look at systems, exacerbations, side effects, patient satisfaction and lung function, and then uh, repeat the cycle um, again. So in terms of definition of, of, of uncontrolled asthma, beginning with the NAEPP EPR3, um, really we focus from looking at the severity of asthma to more looking at control because severity seemed to be something that was was nebulous. Not under, everybody understood what it was. It was kind of kind of fleeting, and, um, and and I think more of us understand whether something is controlled or uncontrolled. And then ATS ERS guidelines, and then the more recent GINA guidelines. But the, the, the 19 GINA guidelines may be our last one. Guidelines are very expensive to produce, and it is getting increasingly hard uh, to get uh, get a consensus. And so. What we at the college has done and the leadership of, uh, of Brad Chips is that we've developed yardsticks and a yardstick can be produced much more rapidly than a, a guideline. The last uh, 07 guidelines took a decade uh, for them to produce and they can pr be produced at a much uh, lower cost. Now, when we're looking at severe asthma, healthcare providers need to understand the different profiles. This is an allergic IgE mediated asthma, eosinophilic, neutrophilic, have airway and smooth muscle hypertrophy. Really, healthcare providers need to know the definition of each one, the biomarkers used, and the proper treatment profile. Certainly in a brief talk, we don't have time to go over this, but there are implications for the medicines uh, that, are, that are available, such as uh, biologics. And we need to know what to do if, if standard therapy doesn't uh, relieve symptoms in severe asthma, that these alternative biologic therapies that uh, are available. Um, we need, <sighs> Greater awareness and understanding among patients, caregivers, healthcare providers, and, uh, and, and policymakers. The, the college, the Allergy Asthma Network, have developed educational tools and, and shared decision making tools uh, so that we get the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. Shared decision making for me is just, just part of my practice. It's a normal routine thing. It was, I did shared decision making before shared decision making uh, was cool. And certainly the, uh, the tools uh, that are available for that are something that we, we have. There's one that was developed by CHEP, the Allergy Asthma Network in the college. It's available at the where, where website. Uh, clinicians and caregivers work collaboratively with the tool. We look at biomarkers to determine which one that one is available. But just simply in, in, in my practice, what I do when we determine that the that, that standard uh, therapy isn't relieving patient symptoms and we want to look at um, an alternative type of, uh, of therapy, I, I in, in, in that visit, at a, at a high level, lay out to the patients what the different types of therapies are that are available. Um, that we need to do a, a laboratory evaluation to help determine which one of those uh, alternative therapies they may be qualified for. And just based on my assessment, give them some either websites or, or written instructions about at least representative uh, types of, uh, of therapies they may be available for. And then when the, um, the, the, the laboratory evaluation comes back, we contact them by phone and, and ask them, you know, based on this, we would like you to focus on on these two or these these three therapies, and then we bring them back for a visit, which I just call kind of my shared decision making visit. We're not, you know, necessarily playing 50 questions because it's usually pretty pretty quick when they come back. That we're just going over over the various treatments, and I go over the risk, the benefits, the frequency, uh, what sort of what sort of side effects, and then I just kind of shut up and, and and listen to the patient for for a little while. And then once they express a preference, then I says, okay, you now you understand that this one has to be given in the physician's office, and you understand and you're going to have to take an epinephrine self-injector for this one or um, yeah, you know that the economics of this one may not be as pleasing uh, on your health care plan and it may be a little bit more of a struggle. Yeah, we, we discussed in shared decision making the economics of it too. Um, you know, with your insurance plan, we've had more success getting this one approved than th this one approved so that the patient gets to weigh all that, including uh, the economics of it. And, and looking at the evolving patterns of asthma management, really, in the 1960s and even, even before, the whole thing was on relieving bronchospasm, whether that was with stramonium cigarettes or short-acting beta agonists. In the 70s, we began to look at preventing bronchospasm, a heavy reliance on theophylline. Uh, we used chromalin in the 1980s to prevent um, allergen-induced bronchospasm. Uh, by the late 80s and the 90s, we understood the role of inflammation and used uh, and inhaled steroids, even combined with long-acting bronchodilators. By the 2000, we're looking more at asthma control and had available the first biologic anti-IgE. 
A 2010, we're beginning to look at personalized medicine and early intervention and exacerbation prevention and patient characteristics. And really, I'm hoping as we move forward in the 2020s to the future, we're going to be looking at population health management and more individualized uh, treatment status. Um, um, so asthma is a variable disease manifested by variability in smooth muscle dysfunction and variability in airway inflammation. Better tools are needed to personalize asthma therapy to better achieve uh, control and utilize shared decision-making tool. And ongoing research suggests that we may identify phenotypes that are likely to respond to existing and emerging therapies. Now, no uh, talk on the status of asthma in 2020 would, would, would be complete without addressing uh, COVID-19. You know, where are we now? I'm reminded of the patriot uh, Thomas Paine. These are the times that try men's souls. And uh, this certainly has been a trying time. A lot of us would you know, like to redo 2020 and do it differently, but we can't do that. I think we at the college have realized that there's no one size fits all uh, solution to all the problems we face. We've seen guidance that have been published by organizations that was out of date even before it was published. The big thing that we're struggling with right now is, is spirometry. We're hearing cries from some of the members that we need to have, have guidance for spirometry, but uh, just like many other problems we face, I can't tell you what's done in each individual practice. You know, I've heard of some people doing spirometry outside, you know, using biologic filters, uh, positive pressure rooms. I can't think of all the permutations for that. And so that's a decision that's going to need to be made locally. I, I think many of us are concerned there may be another shutdown, but I want to emphasize that allergy and asthma services are essential. And then the big question, is asthma a risk factor in COVID-19? Well, certainly uncontrolled asthma is a risk factor in COVID-19. I think we're all fairly comfortable that asthma medicines are not a risk, risk, risk factor. And even some suggestion from the data out of, out of New York that the, the TH2 asthma, and those are the ones that respond to the anti-IL-5 um, uh, alternative therapies, may be protective uh, from COVID. So where do we go from here? Well, those of you who know me know I'm a baseball fan. I'm reminded of Hall of Famer Yogi Bear, a couple of quotes. If you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. And the future ain't what it used to be. And we've already seen COVID-19 has changed the landscape of the medical practices and will likely change it further. I think we're seeing some acceleration of consolidation in the larger groups. But the big change that we've seen is the emergence of, uh, of telemedicine. Um, Health and Human Services and CMS have already announced that some of the crazy rules that uh, Medicare has for, for telemedicine services are going to be waived till the end of 2021. And even though they believe these are legislative changes that Congress needs to make, I think the telemedicine genie is out of the bottle. And I know that that's something that um, Charmaine and, and Tanya and Sally and all the other ones at the Allergy and Asthma Network ha have been lobbying for for some time. So I, I, I see a victory on the horizon there. COVID fatigue is something that we're dealing with with now. You know, just the number of people that, that aren't wearing masks. Here in my office, the screening questions. People are continuing to ask if you traveled out of state. Well, you know, the hotspots are changing so much. We changed our question. You know, have you traveled more than 50 miles from home? And a lot of them look at us and says, well, I came here. But again, on these type of screening questions, there's no one size uh, fit, fits all uh, for, for all of this. And, you know, I think the COVID fatigue is, is probably part of the reason we're seeing increased cases recently along with the winter season and we may be looking at another shutdown. But regardless of what happens in our future, our mission at the college and the Allergy and Asthma Network and those of us as, as people that are stakeholders in asthma, our mission needs to remain the same, ending needless suffering due to asthma uh, and allergic illnesses. So where do we go from here? We need to continue to advocate for access to life-altering drugs as partners. These new novel targeted asthma therapies are incredible. And I'm remembering uh, of history. You know, we see a lot of old books behind my, my head here, the Spanish flu. And they said then that things would never be the same. But within 18 or 24 months, they had entered a time of unparalleled prosperity, the roaring 20s. And a lot of us as, as healthcare providers, as leaders, everybody on this call is a, is a leader, our attitude makes a difference. And I wanna encourage you to spread the contagion of a good attitude, because if you have a good attitude about this, others will have a good attitude about this. And I'm not sure about you, but I don't want to end up someplace else like Yogi Berra said. So um, I want to thank uh, you for the opportunity of speaking uh, to, the, to the asthma uh, summit. 
today and uh, look forward to the, to the remainder of the meeting. I hope it's very productive for you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meadows. And again, we, we have got the message that there was a little bit of an audio issue. It was, we had some volume issues with Dr. Meadows. We will get that resolved for the next uh, presentation. Uh, but we are going to go ahead and move into our second presentation, and it will be by Dr. Bridget Jones. Dr. Jones holds a faculty appointment at a, so, as an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine in the Division of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and also in Pediatric Clinical Pharmacology, Toxicology, and Therapeutic Innovation at Children's Mercy. She is a clinician scientist with a focus in therapeutics and interventions to improve the lives of children with asthma. She is the inaugural chair of the Children's Mercy Faculty and Trainee Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, and is the medical director of the Office of Equity and Diversity at Children's Mercy Hospital. Dr. Jones currently serves as the chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Drugs and the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology's Committee on Asthma Cough Diagnosis and Treatment. Join me in welcoming Dr. Bridget Jones. Thank you. So today I'm going to talk about um, um, racism um, as a public health crisis and as a cause of health disparities. Um, I think, you know, over the past several months, uh, we've seen with COVID um, and also other um, things going on within our society, um, the impact that, that racism has within our society. And I think in healthcare, we're starting to realize that from a structural standpoint, that racism is something that we really need to address if we're going to um, meaningfully address health disparities. So today I hope to um, provide some foundational information about how I think racism is contributing particularly to health disparities for asthma um, for adults and for children. So I have no relevant conflicts of interest. Um, so just to provide the landscape um, for the audience. So we know that asthma is a leading cause of chronic disease um, in adults, but particularly among children. So the perspective to today that I provide um, is um, as a pediatrician and as a pediatric allergist. So I'll talk a lot about um, children. And so we know that almost 40 million people in the United States have a diagnosis of asthma and about 10 million of those are kids. Um, about 8.4% of children have an asthma diagnosis. And about half of children have asthma and report having at least one asthma attack in the past year. So there's significant individual burden of asthma in our society. We also know that there is a financial burden. So asthma costs our society $56 billion annually. And we know that asthma is a condition that's a chronic condition, but people die from asthma as well. So each day, 10 Americans die from asthma. In 2017, it was reported that about 3,500 people um, died from asthma. And as asthma healthcare providers, we know that many of these deaths are avoidable um, with proper treatment care, uh, but also with addressing the societal inequities that I'll talk about today. And so among patients that have asthma, we see that there are significant disparities in asthma prevalence um, among many different populations. Um, but it's well known and striking that black populations and African-American populations, as well as certain Hispanic populations, such as Puerto Rican populations, have much higher asthma prevalence and overall asthma burden in, compar in comparison to other racial and ethnic groups. We also see um, things like poverty um, that intersect and overlap with many of these um, racial and eth ethnic groups that are overburdened, which also um, increases asthma prevalence and morbidity and mortality. Through the decades, um, we've seen that there's an increased prevalence of asthma um, in general, but there's a significant widening 
uh, the gap between asthma prevalence disparities between black population and the white population in the United States. So even though we've made great strides in how we treat asthma, we have several new therapies um, that are effective. We have implemented um, improved strategies for education. Um, we see that there is a significant um, continuing widening of the gap between asthma prevalence um, for black um, patients in um, our country. We know that there is increased healthcare utilization um, among certain populations. So these, um, this diagram here shows that um, for things like ED visits, hospitalizations, and urgent care visits, um, African American and Hispanic populations have increased um, rates of requiring this type of care, but also have increased routine care for asthma as well. Um, and then when you look at death rate or morbidity for asthma, again, you see strikingly that, Amer that African American and the back Black population has about three times the rate of death from asthma in comparison to the white population. So these health disparities are very well known. We also know that across the United States, there are pockets that are more highly burdened with asthma than others. So today, I'm going to use an ex as an example the state that I live in, in Missouri. So Missouri is one of those um, hot, hot pocket states where we have higher prevalence rates, so greater than 9% prevalence rates for asthma and also have higher rates of what we call persistent asthma. So patients that have um, at least weekly symptoms um, for their asthma. So, um, it, so in Missouri, about 60% of the patients that have an asthma diagnosis report um, having persistent symptoms from their asthma. And so um, more specifically within the city that I live in, Missouri, Kansas City, here are some of the data that kind of show you what the area that, that I live in and work in looks like. So in Kansas City, about 82,000 adults and about 31,000 children um, report having asthma. So current prevalence rates among children is about 10%, so higher than national um, prevalence rates. Children count, account for about 40% of ED visits in the region. Um, and African Americans, um, although um, they make up about 15% of the region uh, or the metropolitan area in general make up about half of asthma ED visits in the region and almost half of asthma, asthma hospitalizations as well. And so these are data by county within Kansas City. And so you can see within Kansas City, there are certain counties like Jackson County, the county that, that I live in, um, who have significantly higher um, ED visits and hospitalization rates for asthma than the rest of the, the, the metropolitan um, area and also the rest of the state um, in general. And so today I'll talk about some of the structural reasons why we may see um, some of these, some of these um, disparities. So these are data um, that were pulled um, from our hospital at Children's Mercy that shows children that um, we're seen in our urgent cares and our EDs and were hospitalized for asthma between 2016 and 2018. Um, they had more than four um, annual visits for asthma. And so all of these little red dots here um, represent um, one child that had more than four um, asthma-related hospitalization and urgent care ED um, visits. So this, these dots are low, overlaid here on the map of the Kansas City metropolitan region. So Kansas City is a city that's divided between um, two states. So on the west side, um, you have the Kansas side of the city and on the east side, the Missouri side of the city. And so you can see within Kansas City, these little red dots that represent children with increased asthma utilization um, are clustered within um, some um, particular areas, and particularly on the east side. Um, and so it, with the corresponding data, you can see that many of these children live in Jackson County and that um, more than half of these children um, are Black or African American. These are um, other data that were pulled by one of our critical care um, fellows here at Children's Mercy um, that shows asthma mortality 
um, in our city. Again, here's the Kansas City Metropolitan um, map here with the, the east side or the, the Missouri side and the west side, the Kansas side, um, and shows that between um, 2012 and 2018, there were 19 children that had cardiopulmonary arrest from asthma and eight deaths. And again, you can see here that coincides with the asthma healthcare utilization. Many of these red, red dots that represent children that had morbidity or cardiopulmonary arrest from asthma are clustered here on the, the eastern side of the metropolitan area. Um, I also want to show that um, this, this divide in our city um, is, is somewhat striking because you can see here that this divide is associated with a highway that runs through our city. So Highway 71 is a major um, actually U.S. interstate now that runs through our city um, and has divided um, in many ways the east side from the west side. And so you can see these clusters of cases here that are to the east side of, of this major highway. We also overlay this, um, this data that show healthcare utilization for asthma with what we know the racial makeup is of our city. So these are, is a racial dot map of the Kansas City metropolitan area. And you can see that the green dotted areas um, are areas that are predominantly African American or black, um, or the black community um, live. The orange um, dots are Hispanic. Um, communities and the blue areas are predominantly white communities. So again, there's this clear dividing line between the east um, and the west side here where uh, the African American population is clustered within certain um, areas of, of Kansas City and particularly areas where we see increased asthma, um, healthcare utilization and poorer outcomes. And so you're able to overlay all of these, these maps, so the healthcare utilization map, the racial dot map, with a map that um, was, um, was, was published um, several decades ago. And so what this map shows is redlining in our city. So redlining was a practice that started um, decades ago and was actually started in Kansas City. Kansas City was one of the um, first cities to implement redlining and implemented um, in, a, in a really um, impactful way where banks assign scores to certain areas based on the desirability of that area for funding, for providing bank loans, and for economic development. And so the red areas or the red line areas were the areas that were designated to be less desirable for economic development and for um, bank loans to be, be provided. And so back in the 50s and 60s, when these practices were put in place, um, these scores were mainly uh, provided based on the racial makeup of these areas. So within Kansas City, the red line areas that you saw decades ago were the predominantly African-American um, cities on the, or areas on the east side of the city. So they were red lined, so people in that area could not get bank loans to own their own homes. They could not get bank loans to, to develop and start businesses. And there was an overall lack of economic development in those areas. And so you see um, those areas um, from, from the policies that were implemented decades ago now playing out in what you see with, in regards to poor asthma outcomes um, for the children um, that, that live in those communities today. And so this is an example of how racism and racist policies um, that were put in place decades of, ago still today impact the health care of um, Black and Hispanic children um, in the Kansas City community. So a little over a year ago, the American Academy of Pediatrics put out a landmark policy statement that described that racism um, impacts child health and adolescent health. And they describe racism as a core social determinant of health um, and a driver of health inequities. And they talked about the fact that healthcare providers and anyone involved in the, in the, the health of children needs to be aware of the, the societal impacts of racism and also 
needs to be involved in um, identifying interventions to address um, racism in, in child health. And so many times when we think about racism, we think about racism as interpersonal racism or racism that um, that is from a that that is related to things like a racial slur or a microaggression. Um, but some of the most impactful ways that racism still affect healthcare is more from an institutional um, aspect. So it occurs when you have institutions like the banking institutions that designed rules and policies that result in inequitable opportunities um, for certain um, groups based on what we call race. Um, and so it provides inequitable um, opportunities and disadvantages one group while advantages another group simply based on their, um, their race. And so, Ibram Kendi, um, a author of the um, now very famous and popular book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, talks about um, the fact that racial inequity is a problem of bad policy, um, not so much focusing on interpersonal racism and, and bad individual people, but the policies that have been put in place that um, are designed to oppress um, and, um, and decrease opportunity um, for certain groups of people based on their race, race. And that's really what we need to address if we're going to improve um, health outcomes and dismantle health inequities is from a policy and a structural level. What are the barriers there that are preventing people from having the opportunity for health? So these are um, um, some other data from Kansas City from a researcher um, at Children's Mercy, Dr. Natalie Kane where she assigned um, social and health vulnerability scores to areas, again, within our Kansas City region um, here. And so um, social and health vulnerability um, describes the social disadvantage that certain populations may have based on opportunities for income, opportunities for education, and overall opportunities for healthy um, living. And so these scores were assigned with um, yellow representing um, um, neighborhoods or people that had um, high social disadvantage or high um, social health vulnerabilities. And so again, within Kansas City, um, you see, again, this peer dividing line where in the predominantly um, African-American and Black communities and Hispanic communities, there is much higher social vulnerability in comparison to the areas that are primarily um, white areas. Of the city. So again, you see how these, this legacy of redlining in Kansas City has impacted um, still today the health and well being of people that continue to live in these communities. And so, what happens when you have um, redlining and disinvestment in neighborhoods that leads to this vulnerability are things like um, just the fact that um, climate burden may be different in these different areas within cities. So there are studies that show that within um, black and brown communities across the nation that the there's increased climate burden. So often there's major highways like in Kansas City where there's a major highway that runs right alongside homes on the east side of the city. Um, so that brings pollution. There's more concrete. Um, that actually raises the temperature. There are studies that have shown that the actual temperature in certain neighborhoods, particularly black and brown communities, are higher in comparison to other um, non-black and brown communities in, in major cities. There's less green space um, that also leads to warming, but also um, forbids um, communities to um, enjoy um, healthy lifestyles and healthy living by having walking trails and access and um, being able to exercise, there's lack of opportunity for, um, for um, things like grocery stores um, in these areas um, as well. In, um, in addition to um, things like climate change, we know that these areas often um, are not just um, um, areas that are impacted by climate change and access to healthy um, living, but healthcare access in general is also um, a, a barrier. 
for many of these communities. So these are data that we looked at back in the very early parts of the COVID-19 um, pandemic in May, where we were already seeing disproportionate rates of COVID-19 cases within the Black um, community in Kansas City. And so one of the things that we wanted to look at was the relationship between COVID-19 cases um, in predominantly Black communities versus predominantly white communities and healthcare access. And so these orange bars here are the number of healthcare providers within um, Black communities versus white communities here. And so you see that in neighborhoods that were 50% or greater um, had Black residents compared to 50% or greater white residents, there's almost twice as many primary health care providers in the predominantly white neighborhoods. And even when comparing by income level among the different areas or zip codes within our city, we didn't see as significant of a discrepancy. So the difference in health care access was really driven by race um, within our city. Again, um, leading back to the decades um, practices of redlining that still have caused disinvestment in um, Black communities um, and have led to this, this disparity of healthcare access. And so in thinking about, you know, the different institutions before that I mentioned that um, have um, led to a lack of um, equitable care or opportunity for equi equitable care in Black and and brown communities, we need to address those from an institutional standpoint. So in thinking about the banking system and how wealth impacts the opportunity for health, um, and thinking about how climate change and policies that are implemented in cities um, and states across the country, whether you decide to put a highway in one area versus another area, how that impacts communities. Those are all things from an institutional level um, that we can address um, from a policy um, perspective. But also within the institution of medicine, um, we have to address the fact that um, we contribute to many times to the disparities that um, are observed. Um, I think a lot of the time and how we have addressed asthma has been often from an individual standpoint of um, the, the burden of, of asthma care or the burden to achieve health equity being on the patient and thinking about patients may not have the correct education or um, addressing things like adherence um, to medications, but we also need to take onus of what our role is in, um, in these health inequities. And so some of the things that we need to address are things like our own healthcare provider bias. We know that implicit bias impacts how we interact with others, and certainly we know that it impacts um, how we provide care um, to our patients. So healthcare provider bias um, needs to be addressed. Um, we also need to, within the asthma and allergy community, um, recognize the fact that, um, that race-based medicine um, has played a role in how we treat um, our patients. So pulmonary function testing that we conduct as a standard um, approach for diagnosis and, and treatment of asthma um, has race-based um, flawed um, ideals built within um, that, that testing. And so this is a quote from Gould, um, a physician um, in, from 1969, who was a driver of race-based barometry correction, who stated that smaller lung capacity of the colored race and is it in itself proof of an inferior physical organism. And so we know that these these flawed thoughts and um, falsehoods um, driven by eugenics, um, again, decades ago, still show up in how we diagnose and treat our patients. So these are things as um, specialists in asthma and allergy um, and healthcare providers in this area that we need to root out. Um, and so these types of flawed science continue to impact and harm our patients. Um, we also, as a medical institution, need to address the lack of diversity um, within medicine and healthcare and within science. So we know that there is an overall lack of diversity, um, racial and ethnic diversity among healthcare providers um, in general. And so this has impact because often black and brown healthcare providers will more often work in underserved areas. Um, they're more often to provide care to predominantly black or brown 
um, communities. And we also know that healthcare teams that are diverse um, provide better care in general, and there's better outcomes when healthcare teams are diverse. We also need to think about the diversity of our scientists because who's conducting the science drives what kind of science is being done. And so um, many times black and brown um, scientists are um, invested and interested from a personal standpoint in addressing healthcare um, disparities. And so be able to, to be able to continue to drive this work and um, root out the causes of health inequities. We need to think about um, the diversity of our scientists as well. And this is observed in when we look at the clinical trials that are conducted in um, clinical and translational research. So we know um, that there is a lack of diversity within the clinical and translational research that's conducted within our country. And this has become even more evident um, with COVID-19, where there's been much discussion about the overburden of the COVID-19 disease within um, the Black community, but the um, lack of engagement um, or the ability to engage um, Black and Brown communities in these clinical trials. And so this has been a long-standing problem. And even today for diseases like asthma, which we know impacts Black and Brown communities, particularly children, African-American and Hispanic children, are, have higher prevalence rates and higher morbidity and mortality for asthma. When we look at some of the new blockbuster trials, um, clinical trials that have been done for um, our new line of therapy for moderate to severe asthma, um, the biologic therapies, when we look at the inclusion in those clinical trials and see that there is a significant lack of representation for African-American and Hispanic um, children within these clinical trials in comparison to um, Caucasian children. And so again, um, you know, these, these disparities or these differences in inclusion lead to, continue to lead to the disparities that we see um, today. So this is also something that we need to address from uh, an academic um, and scientific institutional aspect as well. And so when you get all these institutions that have built in bias and policies that um, disenfranchise certain um, groups of people, um, what you see is the impact of structural racism, where you have interconnection of institutions um, that are linked historically and culturally reinforced. Um, and it's how our society um, kind of works together in totality to foster um, continued discrimination um, in reinforcing inequitable, inequitable systems, um, leading to adverse health outcomes. And so we really need to think about from an institutional level how each of these institutions work together um, to reinforce a system of inequity. And so this is an excellent framework um, to think about how race and racism um, impact um, these different institutions um, policies and um, and lead to um, poor asthma um, outcomes within our population. So you have race and discrimination that impacts socioeconomic and political context of so policies, governance, culture, um, which leads to economic disparities, so lack of opportunity for economic stability, educational um, opportunities, which impacts the environment that someone is able to live in and um, their ability to um, live a healthy lifestyle. And then you put all of those together and then you get to potential individual behaviors and choices and in individual, um, in individual um, um, preferences um, that lead to differences in asthma outcomes. And so what you have to start with, I think, to when you're thinking about um, asthma disparities is the impact of what we call race and ethnicity in our country and how discrimination um, has been built upon race and ethnicity that have led to these inequities that are that compound, compound themselves um, to lead to poor health. And so what can we do um, to dismantle um, these inequities in this system of racism that impacts asthma? Um, so I think first, we have to recognize and examine the societal bar barriers that I've talked about to equitable opportunities. 
So we have to address from a structural and in institutional aspect the impact of racism on health. Um, I think it's important to, you know, to consider um, individual um, contributions to health. Um, and and um, but we have to think about this as a societal um, level as well. We need to engage communities um, in identifying the problems and developing solutions. Also, um, we as scientists and we as healthcare providers can't go into these communities and tell the communities what um, is important to them and what the problems are. We really need to engage the communities and let them inform us of what's important to them and what the barriers are and work alongside the communities, not, not necessarily doing the work for them, but a lot of what work alongside them with developing solutions. We need to make sure that we're utilizing anti-racist practices when we're developing resources, support, and interventions. And when I say utilizing anti-racist practices is um, taking a, a look at different aspects of how we provide resources, um, interventions, and care, and making sure that we are not reinforcing some of those policies, biases, um, stigmas um, that have led to continued discrimination of certain groups based on their race, and that we are dividing, designing resources and supporting interventions that actually counter those discriminatory um, policies. And then finally, from a personal level, um, I think it's important that we all check our biases. We all have implicit biases that walk around with us every day and impact how we interact with others, impact how we view the world. And that's something that we continuously, that we all have to continuously uh, address. So when we're interacting with our patients or interacting with people out in the community, we are aware of those biases. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a personal, um, it's a personal responsibility to address your own biases um, when doing this type of work. So with that, I will just leave you with a quote from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. And I think that when we're talking about dress, addressing racism, we're really talking about um, making sure that people are not provided or um, limited from, from having the opportunity of health um, based on their race. Um, and so, again, we just want to make sure that everyone has the same opportunity um, to live a healthy life. So with that, that ends my presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. And we really enjoyed hearing from you, Dr. Jones. Um, we are going to allow some open question and answer time for Dr. Jones. So if you'll type your question into uh, the control panel. We will open Dr. Jones' line. She is here, and we will go ahead and open her line now and have her um, begin to answer any questions that you may have. Let's go to the question and answer box. Um, while we're waiting on some of those and, and trying to get them to uh, come in, Dr. Jones, I'll, I'll field the very first question. And that is, um, you made note specifically of the redlining behaviors. Um, are there other things uh, that, other than, for example, the way in which the infrastructure roads are, are built and banks are lending and those economic incentives maybe to develop areas, um, other systemic issues uh, that are factors that are causing um, health inequities that that you would like to speak to. I saw you had note of the uh, Netflix documentary 13th, which I found to be very intriguing, and, and it really did a wonderful job of highlighting some of those systemic uh, racial bias that that perhaps many of us are unaware of. Yeah, I think you know um, when you look at lots of these institutions, like I mentioned, that come together to form a system of discrimination and oppression all of them have these policies built into it. You know, another aspect to think about is our immigration policies and how preferences for um, how certain groups can immigrate into our country versus others that are don't have as, as easy of paths to come into our country. And even when they get here, there's barriers um, to seeking um, healthcare. 
I mean, those are things that set communities of color up for, for these, these health disparities. So I think across, you know, many of the, the institutions within um, our country, you know, historically, you know, our, the country was, was um, developing, has developed policies historically that have disenfranchised certain groups in order to lift up other groups. So that's rampant really throughout. And I think the important thing is to one, recognize that, to know that, and then two, you know, to develop anti-racist policies to counter those and to make sure that there is um, equitable opportunity for, for all people. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. Now, Dr. Jones, uh, we do have a question from uh, Dr. Bowman in South Carolina, and he asked about your Kansas City neighborhood analysis, and did it actually include pharmacy access or pharmacy availability? No, it didn't include pharmacy availability. That is a really great um, point. So that was a study that, you know, we kind of put that study together quickly in Kansas City when, like lots of large cities, we start seeing this huge um, disparity in COVID cases. And, um, and it, in the beginning, you know, there was a lot of talk about the, that, you know, Black people and Brown people were getting COVID because of personal choices and um, personal things that people were doing to put themselves at risk. And so what we wanted to really show was it's not so much a personal decision to go out and get COVID. It's the fact that you know, there are structural inequities like healthcare. So we wanted to point that out, that there are things structurally like healthcare access in general in these, in these communities that make people more vulnerable. Because if you don't have pharmacies, you don't have doctor's offices, you're not going to be able to access care for your um, preventive care, as well as any chronic diseases that you have to, to stay healthy. But no, we didn't. We didn't look at pharmacy. So that's a really great point. I think we'll we'll go back and add that data point. Great. So the next question comes from uh, Robert, who asks about the 2.7 percent of the uh, cardiopulmonary um, arrest incidents in the Kansas City area. Do you, Do you happen to know what the national average of cardiopulmonary arrest in patients with moderate to severe asthma is? I actually don't, and um, just to, to be specific, so in that, we were wanting to look specifically at, at children, so those were cardiopulmonary arrests um, specifically among children, um, but I don't exactly know the, the national average for that. Okay, great, thank you. The next question comes from Eleanor, who asks in regard about the redlining laws. Um, were those actually established in the 1950s, and are those laws actually still on the books in most states? Yeah, so they were established in the, the 40s and 50s, um, at least in Kansas City. Um, you know, Kansas City was kind of one of the, the birthplaces of, of redlining. Um, and so, you know, the laws aren't still there. Um, I mean, banks actually can't... Um, discriminate by law based on um, racial demographics, but the the kind of underpinnings of what those laws led to is the thing that's still there, that's still hurting everyone. So even though, you know, you're supposed to have the same opportunity to get a mortgage in one side of Kansas City versus the other side of the Kansas City, it still doesn't negate the fact that those areas that have been redlined, they're underdeveloped. Right. You know, they, the, the property levels are, the, the property um, um, levels are, are really low. And so when you're thinking about banks that want to give mortgages still, they may not make that decision based on the fact that it's a black or brown community, but it still may be difficult to get a loan in that area just because the property values um, right. are so low and that these are food deserts and there's not, you know, retail um, in the area. So, so yeah, I mean, the, the, the laws are gone, but the, the impact is still very much there. And the behaviors are embedded, definitely. So our last question for you, Dr. Jones, that we have time for comes from Tracy Inger, our friend at EPA. And she says, how would you suggest that we best go about working with healthcare providers to help them recognize and address the bias that may be affecting their ability to deliver best care? 
Are there any programs that you would recommend specifically for healthcare provider training? Yeah, so one is the implicit association test. Um, so Harvard developed the implicit association test that anyone can access online. Um, and it's a test that helps you recognize your own biases. And so I think it's important to do that first, just to, just to recognize that you have biases, because we all do, but we tell ourselves that we don't. Um, so I would start there with implicit association tests. And then from there, you know, there's lots of um, implicit bias trainings that many institutions and medical environments are now implementing. We're implementing it across our hospital as well. And there's, there's lots of implicit association or implicit bias trainings that's available just for the general public. So I would start with assessing your own biases you know, do some of the reading that's out there. You know, the Kendi Abrams book is wonderful, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist. There's ta Coates is a wonderful author. Um, and just do some of the reading to kind of, you know, educate yourself of kind of how did we get here? Why do we have these thoughts and explore um, your own thoughts? I do feel within the medical field, it's really important for us to think about the new generation of healthcare providers that we're training. And so starting within curriculums for, you know, nursing students, pharmacy students, medical students, you know, everyone that's in, in healthcare should take coursework to teach them about the history of racism and discrimination in medicine, to know what's occurred, um, and also provide them education on how to counter their biases. And so those curriculums are also starting now and being integrated into the medical education environment. Great. Well, thank you so much. We have um, a number of other questions. What I will promise is that we'll put together a, a question and answer follow-up document just on this particular topic because we can see that the interest is certainly here and unfortunately we are uh, running out of time on this topic. I will say there have been a number of good uh, book um, offerings in the chat as well. as So The Warmth of Other Funds is another book uh, that is wonderful and and definitely has a lot of insight into disparities that's been uh, recommended as well. So thank you again, Dr. Jones, okay. wonderful job. We, as always, value uh, your perspective and your expertise in this area and look forward to having you back at, at another U.S. Asthma Summit. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. All right, now we are gonna be moving on to our next presentation before our break, and that is uh, Dr. Joy Sue. And Dr. Sue is a medical officer for the National Asthma Control Program in the Asthma and Community Health Branch Division of Environmental Health Science and Practice and the National Center for Environmental Health at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Sue is board certified in internal medicine and allergy and immunology. And we're honored to have her today. As we said, the U.S. Asthma Summit uh, was birthed out of our relationship with CDC and the National Asthma Control Program, and we're honored to continue to have them as an important partner in this event. Good afternoon, or good morning, depending on where you're watching. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss Exhale, a set of evidence-based strategies we've developed and are using to help people with asthma. Let me first take the opportunity to provide some context. In the United States, about one in 13 people have asthma, or about 25 million people total. Each year, about 1.7 million ED visits and 439,000 hospitalizations are asthma-related. Asthma costs more than $82 billion annually in medical costs, missed school and work days, and early deaths. In this country, there are about 10 asthma-related deaths per day. Many asthma-related ED visits, hospitalizations, and deaths can be prevented through asthma control. Asthma control can prevent symptoms like wheezing, coughing, or difficulty breathing, prevent asthma-related ED visits, hospitalizations, and deaths, and decrease missed school and work days because of asthma. To control asthma, we have developed and are using Exhale, a set of six strategies that each contribute to better asthma control. Exhale is the scientific framework that we and our partners use to implement our asthma control activities in public health. Exhale can help both children and adults with asthma. You might wonder why we use this set of six strategies. Well, 
We have learned from CDC and World Health Organization efforts to address other health conditions and behaviors that prioritizing a manageable number of strategies, like the ones I'll speak about in a few minutes, can sharpen and focus what otherwise might be vague commitments to action and avoid a scattershot approach of a large number of interventions, many of which might only have a small impact. Each strategy in Exhale is evidence-based and has been proven to reduce asthma-related hospitalizations, ED visits, missed days of work and school, and healthcare costs. In this talk, I will briefly introduce you to the strategies in Exhale. As you can see here, Exhale is an acronym that summarizes the six strategies we prioritize in our asthma control activities. These strategies are not listed in order of importance or impact, but arranged this way to make a digestible acronym. The first E stands for Education on Asthma Self-Management, which includes providing education on how to use asthma, asthma medications correctly, what to do if asthma symptoms worsen, and how to reduce exposures to asthma triggers, such as cockroaches or mold. X stands for extinguishing smoking and exposure to secondhand smoke, as tobacco is known to worsen asthma symptoms and lead to asthma attacks. This strategy includes both reducing tobacco smoking among people with asthma, as well as reducing exposure to secondhand smoke among people with asthma. H stands for home visits for trigger reduction and asthma self-management education which includes intensive tailored education on asthma self-management as described in the first E, and home environmental assessments for common triggers of asthma. Not every person with asthma needs a home visit. Home visit programs tend to be more effective and cost efficient when focused on people at highest risk of asthma attacks, for example, people who have had at least one asthma-related ED visit or hospitalization in the recent past. A stands for Achievement of Guidelines-Based Medical Management. This strategy includes strengthening systems that support guidelines-based medical care, including appropriate prescribing and use of asthma controller medications, and improving access and adherence to asthma medications and devices. L stands for Linkages and Coordination of Care Across Settings. This includes linking people with asthma to healthcare and community services when needed, and maintaining communication among those who help people with asthma, for example, healthcare providers or school personnel. The last E stands for environmental policies or best practices, practices to reduce asthma triggers from indoor, outdoor, or occupational sources. This strategy includes facilitating home energy efficiency, including home weatherization assistance programs that support low-income homeowners in repairing their homes which can thereby reduce exposure to asthma triggers like mold or pests, facilitating smoke-free policies, facilitating clean diesel school buses, and eliminating or reducing exposure to asthma triggers in the workplace. You might have noticed these strategies are complementary. I want to mention Exhale can have the greatest impact when multiple strategies are used together in every community. And as alluded to before, every person with asthma does not necessarily need every strategy in Exhale. For example, home visits can be focused on people with asthma who have needed recent hospital or ED care for asthma. I also want to reiterate that every strategy in Exhale has reduced asthma-related hospitalizations and ED visits, as well as reduced healthcare costs. Also, the first five strategies, that is E, X, H, A, and L, have improved asthma medication adherence, shown by reduced rescue inhaler use, increased asthma controller medication use, or improved asthma medication ratios. A frequent question we've received is how can Exhale address social determinants of health? In fact, multiple strategies in Exhale can improve conditions in the places where people live, work, learn, play, and spend time. Specifically, Reducing asthma triggers, for example, through home visits or environmental policies or best practices, can improve conditions in homes, schools, workplaces, and other settings. 
Also, linkages and coordination of care includes connecting people with asthma to local support services that can improve housing conditions. In my last slide, I want to let you know of an exciting development coming soon. Even though we have already published on our website an overview of Exhale and the evidence supporting it, we hope to release online by early 2021 a collection of Exhale guides for various groups of people. Each guide has been tailored to each audience. For example, we plan to release an Exhale guide for public health professionals, such as those who work in health departments, Excel guides for healthcare organizations, including one guide for healthcare professionals, one guide for healthcare system executive leaders, like hospital CEOs and chief medical officers, and guides for health insurance plans. Also, we plan to release an Excel guide for people with asthma, their families, and their caregivers, as well as an Excel guide for schools. Each of these guides will provide practical examples of how Excel can be used by the reader. With that, I'll close and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Sue. Really appreciate um, that overview of the Excel program and initiatives. And we will open the line now if you um, have any specific questions for Dr. Sue about the Excel technical package, uh, please go ahead and enter those into the question bin and we will get to them. There have been questions about the slides. We will be sharing the slides after um, today's presentation, as well as a comprehensive recording of the U.S. Asthma Summit. So you will be receiving those. Um, so I think, uh, Dr. Sue, is your line open now? It is, yes. Okay, thank you so much again for being here and for fielding any questions that we may have about the, the project. How, what is the time length of, of the anticipated time length of the XHEL program? Um, well, actually, um, XHEL is our scientific framework um, and foundation, so it's not term limited or time limited. This is actually the scientific framework and the priorities we've been working with for years now. and anticipate working with for years um, in the future. So this is, and then the great thing about Exhale is that it's, um, it's I mean, the, the most important thing is a common language that we hope many different sectors can use to, to talk about and partner together with about asthma control. Um, and basically, and Exhale can evolve because as there more evidence um, is generated that shows in, um, interventions that have been proven to reduce asthma symptoms or improve asthma control or reduce asthma related ED events, et cetera, it can be um, incorporated into Exhale. So Exhale is a living, basically, is a, it's a living scientific framework. Right. Well, thank you for clarifying that because that, that was my understanding that it was an ongoing um, really scientific framework rather than a program. So the next question comes from Mary and she asks specifically about how some of these interventions are typically delivered. Is it through um, those funded state programs? Is it through community-based uh, partner programs? How would you recommend that um, the stakeholders that are on the line today learn more about the delivery of these interventions? Uh, well, the great thing about Exhale is that um, many different sectors, agencies, and organizations can deliver Exhale-related interventions. Um, you mentioned health departments or public health asthma programs. Those, those are a great start. Um, there are many, many asthma, sort of, include many, including many CDC-funded asthma control programs across the country. We, we support the National Asthma Control Program. You can look it up. CDC National Asthma Control Program contact um, as a way to start looking at what public health agencies might be supporting or delivering asthma-related, exhale-related interventions. But community-based programs um, can also de deliver exhale-related um, interventions, for example, like home visit programs, and often these partner with, um, many are partners with our state partners. Um, so can healthcare organizations like hospital systems have piloted and implemented um, interventions to help people who show up in their emergency departments frequently for asthma-related uh, ED visits. Um, 
so it's I would start you could start with your health department, but definitely, you know, I would also talk to your health care provider, um, look around um, in your sort of neighborhood or regional health care system. And again, I would encourage you in 2021 to come back and look um, look at the materials online. Um, we'll have a website up um, www.cdc.gov forward slash asthma forward slash exhale that can give you more concrete information about how to um, how to use exhale and where you might be able to find exhale related services. And so you said those guys will be coming soon. Can we expect those in the first quarter or second quarter of 2021? Um, there's no, I don't have a specific, I can't tell you which quarter yet, but I'm hopeful. I hope, I hope that it will be early 2021. Okay, great. Our final question for you, Dr. Sue, it comes from Andrea, who actually coordinates an asthma home visit program in Utah. And of course, in this COVID era, has had to move to a virtual format for delivering home visits. How would you encourage or suggest that good environmental assessments can be done uh, remotely. Uh, while some patients are comfortable with walking around with their phone in their home and, and showing you, others are not. So any suggestions that you have for delivering quality home assessments in the midst of COVID? Well, these are that's a great question. These are definitely unprecedented times. And I think, I mean, I have, I've started to see a lot, but I'm really not the expert. I but I've seen an incredible amount of leadership and innovation among um, leaders in the home in, among in the in home visit programs. Um, I would suggest in Utah um, there is a Utah asthma program that uh, that has a lot of experience, and you know I think it's going to be um, people who and programs that deliver home visits. Kind of getting together and talking about what what is working for them in terms of virtual home visits how do they how do they maintain quality how may they and you know how can they improve quality and maybe there may also be ways that telehealth can help increase access for people who would benefit for a home visit but haven't had a chance to um, access one yet so i think we all have to learn from each other I agree. I think that this is a topic that we will um, maybe convene a small working group of individuals who would like to share. Maybe we'll host a webinar on how to conduct virtual home visits most effectively and, and share some of those best practices from state to state. So thank you so much. Again, thank you to the CDC and for their continued support and dedication to the asthma community. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Sue, for being here with us this afternoon. We're going to move into a short video presentation uh, by the National um, Association of Asthma Educator Certification Board uh, before we go to our break. And that presentation is by Kristen uh, Holmesy. So enjoy this uh, few moment video on the role of the NAECB before we go to break. Hello, everyone. And welcome to our portion of the U.S. Asthma Summit 2020. I would like to take a second to express appreciation to the Allergy and Asthma Network and to the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology for inviting us to speak today. My name is Kristen Holmesy, and I'm coming to you today representing the National Asthma Educator Certification Board. I've been a member since 2003, and I have a true interest in asthma education because of my past experiences as a patient, a nurse, and a provider. Why is there a need for standardizing asthma education? The simple answer is, there are now so many devices, and an important part of asthma management is taking medications correctly, as well as regularly. Self-management is empowering and plays a key role in improving the quality of life of a patient with asthma. Our mission is to promote optimal asthma management and quality of life among individuals with asthma, their families and communities by advancing excellence in asthma education through the certified asthma educator process. Today, we are very excited to be able to announce that the NAECB has received accreditation for its certified asthma educator program from the National Commission for Certifying Agencies or NCCA. 
Accreditation demonstrates an organization's commitment to meet or exceed established standards. We are so excited to be able to share this news. I would like to point out some benefits to obtaining accreditation. It provides formal recognition by peers that our program is credible nationally. It ensures that our certificates are leaders in the field of asthma education. It may benefit certificates if their employer gives a monetary increase or promotion within their job title from having an accredited credential. It promotes program improvement for asthma patients receiving care from a certified asthma educator. It can also be a strong factor in program retention discussions. What does a certified asthma educator do? They can do many things. One of the main things that they do is identify strengths and weaknesses with our asthma patients, as well as edu assess educational needs and barriers to healthcare and self-management. They work with individuals, families, and healthcare professionals in a variety of settings to develop, implement, monitor, and revise customized asthma action plans for self-management. They monitor asthma education program outcomes and recommend modifications in order to improve quality and effectiveness. They also can help the community by providing asthma information as well as healthcare resources. In order to further define the roles of a certified asthma educator, we think about the fact that they are experts in teaching, educating, and counseling our asthma patients. They have a comprehensive current knowledge of asthma pathophysiology and management and are able to incorporate developmental theories, recognize the impact of chronic illness in families, work in cultural dimensions, and the principles of teaching and learning. They are knowledgeable about objective and subjective measures used to diagnose and assess asthma control, they're also able to instruct patients on the optimal use of medications and delivery devices, explaining technical concepts in ways that patients are able to understand. Why is certification important? Certification assures that information is obtained from someone who is utilizing information based on scientifically sound concepts of disease management. I can personally share a story of I, that I have of a boy who was around 12 years old, I believe, and he was taught in the ER to use Pomacort with a spacer. So most of you know that Pomacort is not a meter dose inhaler. It is a turbuhaler and is used on its own. So he was using his medication daily. However, because he was using it incorrectly, he was not getting the medication. He had numerous flares, he was on prednisone many, many times. And finally, when we were able to show him how to properly use his medication and evaluate which device would be best for him, his control increased tremendously and he did great. So why is certification important? It's, it's something that you need to make sure that patients are being taught the right information. That is the bottom line. Just a little bit about the beginnings of the National Asthma Educator Certification Board. It was founded in 2001 by Dr. Linda Ford. She's an allergist and some of you may know her. Currently our board makeup includes RTs, RNs, NPs, PAs. We have pulmonologists, we have um, allergists and we also have pharmacists as well. They take the village as they say. One of the most common questions that we get asked is, how do I prepare for this exam? While we do not endorse, nor do we have our own preparation course, we do have a self-assessment exam. The SAE is a practice test, and it's available to download from the website at your leisure, and it's a shorter version of the exam. It contains 75 questions, and it gives you a good feel for how the questions are written and what categories you'll be tested in. It's also a requirement if you are to apply for a Linda B. Ford scholarship. This slide breaks down our exam fees in the United States. $350 for a new candidate, $250 for repeat, and $300 for research. When you're recertifying for the exam, your certification, you're able to use CEUs or take our exam again. Also, when you are certified, 
Your certification is good for five years as of June 1st, 2020. There are increased fees for tests taken outside of the United States. This presentation would not be complete without mentioning the Linda B. Ford Scholarship. This award is named after Dr. Linda B. Ford, who is our first chair and founding member. This scholarship is awarded twice a year in September and April. The application and more information is available on our website. In addition to being able to work with asthma patients in a very influential way, after you pass the exam, consider running for the board of directors. We're always looking for motivated and talented individuals to join us. Current certified asthma educators also are allowed to vote when we have elections. Consider volunteering on one of our committees. Other things you can do is let, letting other people know that you are certified and encouraging them to take the exam. Once you're in the business and are able to use your AEC, let us know how it's helped you. We have a monthly newsletter which can feature your story and it can be found on our website in the certificates corner. If you needed any more reasons to get certified, think of this. With the arrival of COVID-19, individuals with asthma can be adversely affected. The need for certified asthma educators has grown exponentially. If symptoms are well controlled, outcomes can be improved. Wearing a mask, which directly helps decrease the transmission of COVID-19, is comfortable when asthma is managed to the best level of control. You can also expand or develop an asthma education program after being certified around the country. Help asthma patients live their best lives by getting certified and putting their confidence in you. We invite you to visit our website. There's a wealth of information and resources regarding asthma education. Please visit www.necb.com. Thank you, Kristen. We appreciate uh, that overview of the NAECB. Allergy and Asthma Network is partnering with NAECB and actually has reduced rates for any, anyone who wishes to get their certification as an asthma educator. We also have programs that are specifically designed to employ certified asthma educators, and we are working in conjunction with many of the other organizations in the asthma space to ensure consistent reimbursement of as asthma education by certified asthma educators. That's why we believe the partnership with NAECB is so very important and wanted to give them a few moments to, to highlight and bring that to bear if you were not aware of the role of their organization. So we're now gonna take a 10 minute break and we will return uh, at 1.47 Eastern time. So 10 minutes if you'll step away, get a refresher of your water or beverage and uh, we will look forward to seeing you back in 10 minutes. At that time, we'll move into our presentation on telehealth. Thank you.
All right, everyone, welcome back. Thank you for returning from the break. Uh, and I hope we gave you a few moments to catch your breath and to get refreshed for the last part of our program this afternoon. Our next presentation is on a topic that has certainly taken center stage in 2020, and that is telehealth for allergy and asthma. Our presenter today is Dr. Jackie Agori Sibet. Dr. Agori Sibet is a board certified allergy, immunology, and pediatrics, and is the director of telehealth for Allergy and Asthma Network. She's the founder of Family Allergy Asthma Care Center, where she's been in private practice treating children and adults since 1994 in the Metro DC area. She's also clinical assistant professor at George Washington University School of Medicine, where she mentors the next generation of doctors. Dr. Agari is the president of White Coat Resources, a health education consulting service that helps connect patients to therapy through innovative medical messaging and educational programs. Thank you for being here, Dr. Igori, and we look forward to your presentation. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Igori Sabet, and I am the Director of Telemedicine for the Allergy and Asthma Network. And today I'm going to be talking to you exactly about that, telemedicine. Let's start first with some definitions. You know, when I first accepted this position as the Director of Telemedicine, people would say to me, what is that telemedicine? Are you a doctor on TV? That was their understanding. Now this was uh, in 2019, so it was before the explosion of what we've all gotten to know as telemedicine. But let's start with definitions to be sure we're all on the same page. The Oxford Dictionary lists it as we see here, that telemedicine is the remote diagnosis and treatment of patients by means of telecommunication communications technology. And the telemedicine is the exchange of medical information from one location to another using electronic communication, which improves patients' health status. That's really what we're trying to do, is help our patients, help their health status. Well, how do we do this, this use of this electronic information? It can be used for a variety of areas. One is to support and promote long distance clinical health care, and it can be from a long distance, or it can actually really just be from one part of a building to another, but you're not face-to-face. -face. Certainly, patient and professional health care-related education is a great one for telemedicine, and then public health has become very uh, necessary in these days with COVID and public health administration. Let's look at a couple of statistics now. When I first started with telemedicine, as I said, especially in this role as the director for the network, uh, it was in 2019, but let's look at what's happened since then, especially because of COVID. And what you can see is that in 2020, there was a huge increase in the use of telemedicine from 49% um, up to 49% from just 11% in 2019. And that nowadays we believe that um, healthcare providers are giving 50 to 175 times more telemedicine visits than they did in the uh, previous year. It's become quite a, uh, a significant uh, business in that with the results of coronavirus and telemedicine, it's estimated that it's about a $250 billion uh, cost to the U.S. healthcare system. Now, HHS has an interesting look at this to sort of tell us the past, the present, and the future of telemedicine. And they did this survey of about 300 practitioners, and they did this, remember, in April. So April was just when we were really getting into a lot of telemedicine because of coronavirus. And at that time when they did that survey, they the physicians that answered them reported that before the COVID uh, crisis, there were 9% of their patients using telemedicine. And they particularly were talking to people who were oncologists, who would have the need for a lot of patients to want to stay at home, other specialists and some primary care. So it was 9% before, and then it went up to 51% of their visits. And then they predicted it will be about 21%. But I'd say I think it's going to be a whole lot more once the pandemic is over because uh, you can't really put the genie back in the bottle. 
people really um, have come into uh, getting used to telemedicine. So let's take a look at this quick survey. And this survey was done, again, at the very beginning of the pandemic. And at that time, two thirds of the people said that the pandemic had certainly increased their willingness for virtual care. They saw the benefit of not actually going into the doctor's office, but having that contact virtually. And 38% of those uh, people felt that the number one reason they wanted to do this is so that they didn't get infected. And I want to pause for a moment and talk about coronavirus has certainly brought to us all the importance of infection control. But now we're coming into the winter and whether we're talking about flu as an in influenza or coronavirus or bacterial infections like strep that go around our community every year or some communities have had a lot of problems with staph, um, pertussis, all of those infectious diseases is we should all be concerned about infection control and telemedicine certainly has an important role to play in that. Let's take a look at the types of telehealth visits that we have, and you'll see listed here. It can be done for brand new patients, patients that I've never seen before. I can start with them with telemedicine, follow-up visits, and certainly urgent care visits. And I'm going to go through a little scenario on each one of these. The benefits of telemedicine are, number one, you get that increased uh, access to specialists. Now, with the pandemic, we have seen some loosening of rules where you can take care of patients in uh, states that are bordering yours or far states from where you're licensed. So that has certainly been able to increase the amount of specialists that uh, people can be in contact with. There's definitely that increased ability to get a hold of your healthcare provider, which should lead to an increase in adherence. Because if you've got a problem and a question and you can pop in with a telemedicine visit, you've got that much better follow up on your care. Definitely using it as a modality for patient education is a big, big boon. And that's because we're able to use uh, this in so many ways to be able to uh, send out information to patients. And that shared and accompanied decision making with family members is another big uh, uh, point of telemedicine. So let's look at that in particularly. Let's take that patient who's dialing in for the first time. They're dialing in from home and they're able to address their concerns right away. Uh, and they're able to do this in a very timely fashion. And I think that's really important. Here's what you can expect uh, from a telemedicine visit. Let's say you were doing this the very first time and you were going to give me your full medical history. Well, there's no reason why you can't give me your full medical history. And in fact, you can pre-send some of that in. So instead of coming into me like people used to with binders full of page after page of reports, you can synthesize that out into a shorter report and send it to me ahead of time. I'll have time to preview that before our visit and we're really ready to go then. You can also address whatever your symptoms and concerns are because first of all, you feel like you're in a much more private setting. When it comes to the physical exam, people often ask, how does that really work in telemedicine? And oftentimes there's a lot of things that we can literally see. Skin exams are really pretty easy. I can see if you're breathing hard because you're pulling your muscles. I can have you use your hands and palpate for me on your lymph nodes. You can certainly open your mouth and uh, show me uh, the back of your throat as, as best we can. Um, you know, it's a little difficult for me to look inside your ear without having a special tool, but uh, but there's a lot that we can do on that physical exam, even, even tell your muscle strength um, and some of your reflexes too. Then after we're able to get to assessing those symptoms, and I can certainly send you for all kinds of laboratory work, and then we can make the diagnosis, maybe not as part of that first telemedicine visit, but as part of a telemedicine routine and regimen, we can get that all done. And it leads to that very nice part of that shared uh, decision-making because we're able to really have that conversation back and forth. Now, where does that come to, again, with new patients in particular, is they feel like 
They don't need to leave home. They can access their care right there. It lowers their um, exposure to COVID as we talked about and other environmental triggers as well. So imagine you were an allergic patient or you were a, uh, a cold sensitive patient um, or um, it was really hot out or really dry out. All of those things don't have to happen. You don't have to leave your home. People with severe asthma are really going to benefit from telemedicine, and we're going to go into some of those cases a little later uh, because they can be monitored so frequently and at home. Even those um, urgent visits uh, with the asthma flares. And one example I want to give you straight off the top is the use of steroids. So we at this asthma summit are all very aware of that stewardship of oral corticosteroids and how we don't want to just willy-nilly be giving those to patients. So let's look at the traditional system first. Patient gets into trouble, has an asthma flare, goes to an urgent care or a walk-in, and is then using and, and being prescribed oral corticosteroids when they may not really need that because it's happening through an urgent care. Now I want you to look at that through telehealth. Imagine if you had your flare and you were able to contact your tried and true provider who knew you well and knew what you were on. You may not end up with just that, as we say, treat them, street them set of oral corticosteroids. And that's the benefit of telehealth because they'll have access to your records and you can do this um, quite quickly. And there are quite a few um, practices that will have those urgent care patient appointments open to be able to handle that. So again, let's move on to now this topic of urgent care altogether in telemedicine. It's that quicker access to care is many patients would put this off. You know, you'd start getting some symptoms and you'd say, I'm not going to worry about that quite yet. I'm going to wait until tomorrow. Maybe it'll get better the day after. I have a, a trip out of town when we used to have those kind of meetings out of town. Like I was coming to the allergy and asthma summit. I'm not going to handle my particular medical concern right now. But you can still do that with telemedicine, even if you were to attend a meeting in person or have to be at work in person, you can still sign up for that telemedicine visit and get that uh, problem addressed much quicker. Hence, you're not doing that walk-in care that people used to do in the after hours time. Again, you have a more uh, continuous care because your records are accessible to your tried and true provider. And think about how that's going to fit in with urgent care in particular. When we're thinking about urgent care, and even when we're thinking about maintenance and follow-up care of asthmatic, what is the goal? The goal has always been this one thing, and it's so true now, especially in the time of COVID and infection control. The goal has always been not to have an asthma attack. Asthma is a chronic disease that comes in flares, but you never actually get rid of it. But what we're trying to do is stop those flares. That has always been our goal. Well, with telemedicine, we can stop you from having to come into a dangerous place like an emergency room and get exposed to uh, COVID or other infections to help with that flare. But more importantly is we can get to you right at the beginning when you start to have those symptoms and address those triggers immediately. And I think that's such a benefit for, um, for our urgent care visits. Let's go on and take a look at uh, how this is benefiting particularly with the family and how we can really have that shared decision making, not just between physician and patient, but we can have that shared decision making with physician and whole caregiver team. So you can have your whole family come in on the, the telemedicine visit, which especially now with COVID, you're very limited to who can come into the examining room. And you can have that list of questions all printed up and ready to go. So you're not searching around trying to remember what are the answers to the questions that you that I'm asking you in terms of how sick have you been or how what medication are you taking? And certainly you can pre-submit a whole bunch of data to me ahead of time. So I have such a good idea about what's been happening with you. So let's take a look at what that follow-up visit would look like. So we've been through that new patient visit, we've been through that urgent care, and now let's take a look at what the follow-up visit would look like on telemedicine. Well, the kind of questions I'm gonna ask are, what's happened since you've last been seen? And my hope is by having the common triggers that are around you to remind you at home, 
how your asthma has been, you can look around and say, oh, that's right, I, I did have an asthma attack this summer. I did um, end up with a burst of oral steroids because you can walk right over to the medicine cabinet and, and figure that out. I did have a bronchitis, a sinusitis, and I was given antibiotics. But most importantly, you can go look at your albuterol inhaler for me and tell me how often have you been using that. So with all of those kinds of questions, we can get all of those things dealt with much more efficiently and quickly over telemedicine so I can get you that new prescription or get the patient that new prescription for whenever they um, have run out of it so we don't run into that problem. We like to break up uh, telemedicine visits into sort of a, strat a stratifying it between a low risk and a higher risk in treatment. So I wanna discuss with you what are some of the low risk treatments that we do for asthma patients. One is biologic therapy. They're, these are, of course, you, you know, these are those uh, predominantly monoclonal antibody driven therapies that are given to really severe asthmatics. So these are people that have had multiple episodes of asthma flares in the year, or they're on chronic oral corticosteroids. And these biologic therapies have really drastically reduced their number of asthma flares, and it's reduced the amount of oral corticosteroids that a patient is on. But how do we keep them on, get them on it and keep them on it, maintain them on it and maintain good control? That's a perfect one for telemedicine because quite a few of these biologic therapies actually can be given at home. They are injections, they can be given at home, they can be given even this way via a virtual visit if the patient wants to be monitored while they're giving themselves that. But you can have those frequent follow-ups for biologics. Immunotherapy, which used to be simply allergy shots, but now we have uh, sublingual FDA-approved tablets. Immunotherapy, which is such an important part in asthma control, can also be done at home. It's another therapy that can certainly be started even at home. You need to take the first dose uh, in a in a healthcare provider setting to be monitored for 30 minutes. But you can have your whole workup, your history, your lab testing, and your diagnosis testing done through telemedicine, started on the therapy, and then maintained on that immunotherapy via telemedicine, as opposed to the way we used to do it with allergy shots. And then lastly, just that allergy assessment in general. Imagine if we had the kind of visit where a healthcare provider could watch the patient go around their homes and show me where does the dog sleep? Show me how humid is it in your house? Show me where are all those reservoirs of mold and how close to the house and the air conditioning um, are, is the tree that's putting off all that pollen. Another great resource for uh, education is certainly telemedicine. So let's take a look at that. One would be, I need to be able to uh, educate patients on how to use their inhalers correctly. And I can do that with sending out videos to them. I can do that through working with a patient through the portal. And when I need to manage their asthma, the number one thing I wanna be able to manage is how is your lung function? I can certainly talk to them about, tell me how often you've used your albuterol. It will give me a really good idea about what your lung function is. There are even um, uh, remote spirometries that we can use. And I can also find out what is the medicine that you've been taking? Show it to me, show me how you've been taking it, and we can do that medicine man management by dialing it up and dialing it down. These are some of the things I was talking to you about, the digital inhalers, which is a great one. If I could just get little blips on the screen about how often you've needed to use the albuterol, it tells me how uh, well it controlled the patient is. If you need to use it, of course, more than twice a week, we know that the patient is out of control. We could do the same with maintenance medications. If they're not actually using them, no wonder things have not, not gone well. Uh, there are smart thermometers and smart spirometers as well. There are more high-risk treatments um, that we can still do with telemedicine, and the number one high risk is an asthma flare. But remember, that's the goal. We want to try to decrease those flares. So telemedicine, it should be used for those urgent visits to get to the patient just as they're having the start of symptoms so we can manage that medication and dial it up way before we ever get to a flat-out, full-on asthma attack and an exacerbation. That's a great use of telemedicine. 
When we put it all together, that means be prepared, plan ahead, and address how you can tackle your asthma and allergies, particularly now with these tools. In a way, it's a gift. It's a gift that we have now, this ability to be able to use telemedicine. What has the network done about this? Well, in particular, for allergists and other healthcare providers that are experts in asthma care, we do have a platform uh, that is available for those healthcare providers, and that is to help them administer um, asthma uh, telemedicine visits. And then we have trained coaches. This is a wonderful program of asthma educators and asthma coaches that will partner with the patients specifically to manage their asthma at home. And I'm proud to say that the network had this all in the works before COVID. This wasn't a, oh, now what do we do? This was a well-planned out uh, idea before COVID and that whole explosion of telemedicine ever hit. And it's nicely placed. So I'm gonna close really with how our lives have changed, certainly from this year's summit to last, from last year's summit. There is absolutely more emphasis on our overall health and especially on our respiratory health. We're really spending more and more time online and so therefore patients can use telemedicine, particularly to be able to find that, that asthma education and then to be able to interact with their physician or healthcare provider. Telemedicine is really filling that important space for people who want to be able and who are motivated to be able to keep their asthma in good check, and yet they want to do so from their safety from an infection standpoint at home. So I hope that this has been an informative uh, presentation for you, and I thank you very much for your attention. And uh, we here at the network are very excited about telemedicine and all that that's going to bring going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jackie. Um, I wanna spend just a few moments going a little bit deeper into the telehealth program that Allergy and Asthma Network has been working on called Not One More Life before we go to our Q&A on telehealth for Dr. Jackie and myself. So the Not One More Life Trusted Messengers program is one that we um, are very excited about and we wanna share a brief video and an overview of the program here. Trusted Messengers is an allergy and asthma network project bringing testing, education, and care to often overlooked communities. The people that got together to come here to be able to make sure that we're healthy, uh, to make sure we're making the right advances, not just uh, uh, for our health, but also for our, our wellness, and to put all this together, I think was a, a very, very big deal. From the time I pulled up the gate, I was welcomed. They walked me through the process. They made me feel very comfortable. The people who are driving through uh, to be tested. Some are essential workers, some are families, and our community lacks those resources. An event like this makes me feel good because it uh, lets me know that someone actually cares about my community. For the um, African American community, we are predominantly affected health -wise. We're We're in those fields where we are exposed. Put all this together to have free testing, they were educating me what I need to know about my body, which made me feel comfortable that I'm on the right track. To be able to help us stay healthy and do the things that we need to do to be able to thrive as a community. So I love the fact they're just not helping me, but they're helping others as well, and they're helping generations to come. To have uh, uh, no insurance needed. My parents are uninsured, like so many other Americans. So for the fact that I was able to come, and it's a free service. We all have an opportunity to come together uh, to do something that's going to affect us all as a community, I think is super, uh, is super important. It's essential. This is the epitome of serving your, your community, you know? So thank you, guys. Yeah. The doctor even thanked me for coming, but I want to thank them for the service. We thank you for your time, really, from my heart. The end of each event is only the beginning. Trusted Messengers connect communities to long-term follow-up and education to support life. see from the video, um, we do have the Trusted Messengers pilot program that was started in Atlanta, Georgia um, in September of this year, where we held two live events with drive-through and walk-up, COVID screening, respiratory screening, um, general health screening, and where we also provided uh, a wealth of other resources like food vouchers, flu shots, and school supplies for communities in need in that inner city of Atlanta. 
And the cool thing about the Not One More Life Trusted Messengers program is the vision and the mission and, and the way that we have these three key strategic priorities that are the, the pillars of this important project. And so we have three aims. The first is to drive community engagement, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment, how we are empowering lifestyle changes and healthy behaviors and helping patients to realize, people to realize, that there are certain steps they can take to be more informed and active in their own healthcare outcomes. And then secondly, expanding healthcare access. Um, we have designed the program to really address many of the systemic barriers that Dr. Jones spoke about earlier. So how do we address those barriers to care for those high-risk patients that are at risk for COVID complications and may be living with underlying chronic illness? And then the third pillar is this acceleration of digital innovation. And how do we take patient insights and turn it into truly personalized solutions, leveraging telehealth and digital health. So the program, as I said, did con consist of live virtual testing in Atlanta, where we had these educational events, and then we actually stratified the population and are now enrolling up to 100 patients from those communities that are living with chronic respiratory conditions like asthma, COPD, and other lung health issues into a 16-week virtual intervention that includes telehealth coaching and digital health remote monitoring, as well as virtual education. Um, and so again, you can see some of the principals and the partners. We've partnered with many African-American churches and Latino community centers to really reach the population and to be those trusted messengers in these underserved communities. The timeline, again, we did this pilot starting in September. Now we are moving forward with that 16 week intervention and you can see some of the activities around that. We'll have the data in late Q1 of 2021 and we'll be able to share with you exactly in this population of the higher risk group, um, how they uh, access the telehealth visits, how they performed with the remote spirometry as well as remote pulse oximetry and exhalation breath monitoring. We'll also know how many of those patients went on to develop or, or to contract COVID and if they had any complications during the course of that four month intervention. And we're using validated tools like the AirQ tool from AstraZeneca um, to assess both control and risk impairment um, in asthma and, and the capture tool in COPD. So using these validated tools with the remote monitoring and telehealth has been instrumental in moving this project forward. So again, we've conducted the two live events where we have now screened over 500 individuals and we've got about 20 to 30 patients that are recruiting, that we are in that recruiting process and working towards their inclusion in the 16 week intervention. That 16 week will be December 1st through March 31st. And again, ultimately we hope to have up to a hundred participants. So if you know of anyone that uh, may have less than optimally controlled asthma or COPD and um, might be interested in getting that free telehealth coaching and remote monitoring, please reach out to us at the network and we'd love to get them involved in the project. This does highlight those three um, areas of the strategic framework of the Not One More Life Trusted Messengers program and how we've been moving forward in each of those areas. And then this is a deeper dive of some of our uh, partners and community advisors and each one of those three pillars. Uh, what you can see is that we've got pre-screening and education on a wonderful platform through Health Storylines, where it's a real world application that's collecting all of this data and allowing us to not only explore the asthma um, symptoms and, and medication use and, and um, track their asthma, but also their other comorbidities. And so Health Storylines and Self Care Catalyst have been an instrumental partner in this entire program of expanding healthcare access and, and really partnering to ensure that patients are aware of why they're at higher risk and, and why um, we are in their community providing the support. Uh, you can see here that we are providing PPE as well as school supplies, COVID screening, asthma and COPD screening, and then ongoing educational resources um, on COVID-19 and respiratory disease. And then finally, this community health hub. This is where we hope to tie it all together 
with our telehealth platform, our webinar hosting, the screenings, the validated screening tools that I mentioned before, the health questionnaires like the AirQ, um, which has, is, is now being launched and promoted publicly and will be released even in primary care over 2021 and beyond. And then uh, telemedicine, health education, Clinical trial recruitment is in phase two of the project, we will, where we also will address some of the issues that Dr. Jones spoke about, about ensuring that clinical trials are reflective of the full community, because we know that right now most asthma trials are not. And then finally, the virtual care navigators. So in 2021, we'll actually employ care navigators, individuals that have their certification in helping to support patients in understanding their health care, um, their health insurance and navigating their health care. So going through those prior authorization processes or appeal processes. And so we're very excited about how the network is building this community health hub, digital hub to truly translate what we've learned from individual patient data insights into highly personalized solutions. So at this point, I'll open it up and uh, ask if there's any questions specifically for Dr. Aguari or myself about the telehealth program at the network and how telehealth is really and truly revolutionizing asthma care. So Dr. Jackie, are you, is your line open now? It is. Great, thank you. All right, so go ahead and uh, present your questions in the chat box um, or in the uh, question panel of the control panel. So the first question comes from, from Veronica, and she asked, is there a gap of telemedicine availability in different age groups or ethnicities? Have you seen that there are certain groups that are more uh, willing to try telemedicine? I, let me do the age uh, group first, and this is all uh, very um, anecdotal. But you would assume, of course, that younger physicians are very fluent. Uh, with this kind of communication. What's been really interesting is in a variety of different uh, medical fields is how more senior physicians, um, some of whom were actually thinking of retiring uh, specifically because of the pressures of COVID and wanting to worry, you know, wanting to take care of their own health. They've been able to resurrect themselves or reinvent themselves specifically because they have this modality um, of, of, of being able to communicate back and forth. Um, and, and for ethnicities, um, what I can say is definitely there are some cultural awarenesses in terms of being seen on camera, um, being seen up as close as we're seen, um, how that makes uh, some people from a variety of different backgrounds uncomfortable, um, as, as well as uh, the positive side, which is, again, with telemedicine, the beautiful thing is you are not just limited to who's within your driving distance. And if you were particularly looking for somebody who you could speak to in a particular language, um, or from a particular cultural background, it is so much easier now to find that person uh, because you have the breadth of the, of the whole internet to find that person. Yeah, and I would say that in our experience, we've not seen um, differing rates of adoption of telehealth based off of um, ethnicity or race. Now we have seen some differences of age over time, but I think that that's changing, especially in the last year that as we spoke about, um, the adaptation to televisits is, is uh, the adoption is, is much greater, um, regardless of age. The other thing I would say is that it does depend on high speed internet accessibility. So that's one of the key ways that the network has also been advocating on policy changes to ensure that universally people do have access to high speed internet, because that oftentimes can limit someone's experience in telehealth. Um, so our next question comes from Helen, who uh, points out that, you know, mobile vans have actually been used for a long time in serving underserved communities to address many of the barriers to medical care. Um, Post-COVID, do we think that telehealth may decrease the need for these mobile van services in underserved communities? 
No, in fact, I think it's going to increase the need, but in a different way. Um, I could imagine that where the mobile van before would be the one stop for both the history, the physical, and whatever sort of testing needed to be done. And then for the follow-up where you're repeating that all over again, I think the mobile van is really going to be the extension of the hands, is that you can very nicely and easily get an awful lot of the communication and the, the history, which is such an important part of the visit, through telehealth and then do a majority of the physical even. But when you needed to have truly the hands, the mobile van arrives with hands and people can come to that mobile van and again, have that experience where it's close to home because the van is showing up in your neighborhood and where it's much more timely for you that you don't need to take all of that time to pack up, get in the car, go to the office, wait for an eternity, and then get into an exam room. Yeah, so I think, I think that's an uptick, and, and particularly when it comes to really taking the part of visits that was procedural, whether that be getting the wax out of somebody's ear, whether that be something for us in the world of allergy, doing skin testing or pulmonary function testing, which would be really kind of nifty because you could literally do it outdoors, right? You could take your, your spirometry and, and move it right outside the doors of the van and, and, and have that be so much easier. Um, so I think it's gonna be uh, an increase. Yeah, yeah, I mean, as we saw in the video, when we were doing spirometry in drive-through form, so you could do spirometry anywhere if you, um, you know, really need to, but I, I agree. I think that this could only increase the need and the demand for mobile services. I think that people are going to be uh, much more demanding around convenience of care and much more empowered as we move forward in, in asking and seeking those types of services, which we'll talk a little bit more in our uh, closing remarks about moving forward. So the next question comes from Margaret and she asked, do you think that insurance companies will continue to reimburse um, telehealth in the same way post COVID? So I practice in a state that pre-COVID, that was true. So I didn't need COVID to make that true. And um, so I haven't experienced what that's like making that choice between, am I gonna see that patient um, virtually or am I going to make them come into the office because it's a difference in my reimbursement. Um, but I would say now that, that the country has experienced this, I think again, what what you're saying, Tanya, is patients are gonna demand it. Uh, and that what reason can you give for th that to be at a, a lower pay point? Um, really, what legitimate reason can you give? Well, and I think what we've seen is that, of course, the emergency measures have been extended through, through, through CMS through the end of the year. Um, we definitely don't anticipate that we're going to see um, significant declines in the rates of COVID cases through the first quarter of the new year. And so I do believe that that emergency status of telehealth parity will be extended at least through the first quarter, if not then permanently. And at that point, it will have been over a year of telehealth parity across the country. Um, I do think this is one of those instances where there is no putting the genie back in the bottle, as we've alluded to all day. Um, I think that it, it is absolutely going to be um, continue to be uh, reimbursed consistently and on parity. And I also um, hope that we have the metrics to be able to show that by doing these interventions with telehealth, have, are we able to then actually cut down on those really expensive urgent visits? So some questions about the Not One More Life program and our asthma coach program. Um, under that program, we do have uh, fully funded asthma coach visits for free for patients. So if you're interested, please do reach out to us at Allergy Asthma Network. We'll certainly uh, provide, you can go to trustedmessengers.org or direct patients to go to trustedmessengers.org to complete that initial screening and see if they qualify for those free services. But free remote monitoring, free asthma coaching. Um, historically, outside of that, again, we have been charging for those visits. Um, and there's more information on our website about that. But we're looking at ongoing in 2021 and beyond, how do we make sure that cost is never a barrier? And that if someone needs 
that asthma coach, the development of self-management skills that we are there with certified asthma educators to provide it um, in, in that virtual setting. And so that's a commitment that I have uh, been fully invested in as the leader at Allergy and Asthma Network for the last three years and certainly will continue to move forward as part of our strategic objectives. Um, a question here around at-home spirometry and is there, uh, is there smart spirometers to make sure that we're doing it correctly and getting objective measures of lung function? So Tanya, I'll let you take most of that, um, except uh, to say that, yes, there are certainly a variety of, of at-home uh, spirometers, but, but Tanya, I know you're much more familiar yeah. with Right, a number of them that meet the ATS ERS guidelines and are um, reproducible and, and are um, easy to use. Um, I would say that uh, as, as any therapist, respiratory therapist on the line or asthma educator on the line knows uh, and, and clinician, it's, you know, if we don't get a good effort or garbage in, garbage out, if you don't know what you're doing and administering spirometry, there does need to be some coaching and, and also, of course, the interpretation of those loops afterwards. So we um, are, are strong believers that especially spirometry at home should only be used in the context of that telehealth visit with a provider or a coach setting where someone is actually helping you to interpret the loops. And one of the things I can add to that is that as, as a telemedicine physician, I have certainly had an opportunity to have patients be in another medical location, but I'm not there. And what's wonderful about that is I actually get to witness the spirometry in a much more intimate way than I normally would if the patient was in the office and they were down the hall getting that done. So it's in, within the setting when I can actually see it and, and oversee it and I'd be able to do the same thing with people at home. Wow. So um, there, one question just in regard to the actual time, uh, and you, you sort of alluded to it right there, do you actually feel like that you're spending more face-to-face -face time with your patients in this telehealth era than perhaps you even did when you were moving from room to room? Yes, I feel that and my time is so much better spent um, in that even when you normally came into the office and one of the medical assistants would start to populate a bunch of things is it, that still happens in a telemedicine visit is you may not meet with me right away, but things are populated. And in many cases, things are populated even ahead of time, meaning the day before you as a patient are able to scan in pictures, test results, um, and all sorts of parts of history that I can then review instead of having to hear it when I walk in the room and you as a patient have to repeat it for the fourth time. So, you're so I think you're much more happy with it. Better prepared, it sounds like. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gray. This has been fascinating and, and lots of questions, uh, again, that we won't have time to get to. But um, I appreciate your time and your expertise and certainly your leadership and in, in our Right at the bell. Right. <laughs> yes. Uh, presentation. So our next presentation is actually a panel of uh, the Excellence in Asthma Management EPA 2020 National Asthma Award winners. And this panel is going to be moderated by Tracy Mitchell, who is a registered respiratory therapist and certified asthma educator working with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in Washington, D.C. For over 20 years, Tracy has been uh, such an instrumental part of the asthma community and has used that clinical experience and expertise to guide national policy and develop education materials and support efforts of asthma programs like so many of you work for each uh, across the country. Well, she's going to be joined by two of the award winners. The first is Michelle Bosworth. Dr. Bosworth is a family physician who serves as the executive director at the UTHSCT Center for Population Health, Analytics, and Quality Advancement for the School of Community and Rural Health in Texas. In her role, she actually oversees the University of Texas Health Science Center uh, Breath of Life Mobile Asthma Program. So we're gonna learn much more about best practices of mobile units from Dr. Bosworth. And then we'll hear from Melanie Gleason, who is a phys physician assistant and is a senior instructor for the Department of Pediatrics and associate director for the School-Centered Asthma Program at Children's Hospital of Colorado. 
She's a member of the Children's Hospital of Colorado asthma team and has been focused on patients with high-risk asthma and school-based programming. So some of the questions that we didn't get to in that last session were around telehealth and school-based asthma programs. And so I'm excited to hear from both Dr. Bosworth and Melanie, as well as Tracy. Hi, my name is Tracy Mitchell, and I'm a res registered respiratory therapist and a certified asthma educator at the Indoor Environments Division at the Environmental Protection Agency in Washington, D.C. Um, we've had, EPA has had a long-standing relationship with the Allergy and Asthma Network um, on many different projects and products over the years, and um, I have to say that uh, participating in the Asthma Summit is one of my personal favorite projects, uh, but we're so pleased to be here. So thank you to Tanya and to Marcella and to Sally for having us here uh, with you today and to uh, help us present our 2020 National Asthma Award winners. Um, I just want to give a brief overview of what you're going to hear from us today uh, before we move on to uh, the meat of the program. So I'm going to just talk very briefly about EPA's National Asthma Program and, and the components of our work. I'm going to give a short description of EPA's National Environmental Leadership Award and Asthma Management. And then you'll hear from our 2020 award winners, um, Melanie Gleason from the Children's Hospital of Colorado and Dr. Michelle Bosworth from the University of Texas Health Science Center at Tyler. So this very busy slide uh, gives a little bit of history on EPA's national asthma efforts. And um, you'll see uh, from the over 25 years from the uh, 90s and into the early two, 2000, um, we really spent uh, the majority of our focus on educating clinicians and the public, uh, as well as uh, making sure that environmental asthma management was incorporated into national guidelines and national standards. Um, as we moved into the mid to 2005 uh, range, um, that's when we introduced our National Environmental Leadership Award in Asthma Management, so you'll hear more about that. Um, and then we moved into um, actually working with our federal colleagues um, to uh, conduct research and to confirm the importance of indoor environmental trigger management and actually the importance of in-home environmental assessment um, uh, education and intervention. Um, for the past several years, uh, we focused our coordinated efforts at the national level on um, facilitating action and collaboration across health, housing, and the environment um, in, in, order, in order to address asthma disparities through in-home environmental services. Um, in the most recent years, um, we have been uh, moving towards uh, focusing our efforts on not just making sure that in-home services are available, but we're working on infrastructure to sustain and to expand those that critical care component to all, all uh, people with asthma uh, as far as um, in-home services go and helping programs get reimbursed for those services. So EPA's uh, leadership uh, in asthma uh, really is focused on meeting communities and stakeholders where they are um, through a variety of platforms. And so these COGS represent um, kind of the major components of our work. We host learning spaces through asthmacommunitynetwork.org, which I hope uh, many of you or all of you are members of Asthma Community Network, um, as well as EPA's website, epa.gov. Uh, we work to surface, highlight, and spread best practices through our awards recognition program, and I'll, you'll hear more about that in just a moment. We provide technical assistance nationally through grants and cooperative agreements, and then we work with our federal partners uh, to advance policy at the national level through the Asthma Disparities Working Group, and the President's Task Force on Environmental and Health Safety Risks to Children. 
We also work with uh, local uh, community programs through what we call our community of practice, and that's a way for programs to come together and learn from each other and then share that learning. Um, all of this is, again, synthesized and spread uh, nationally, so we're able to hopefully um, uh, accelerate best practices and um, that learning across the country. So just a little bit about EPA's um, award. Uh, this is the National uh, Environmental Leadership Award in Asthma Management. Um, this is the only national award for uh, comprehensive asthma management, um, excellence in asthma care that includes environmental uh, asthma management. Um, for uh, the past uh, 16 years, uh, this is, we're going into our 16th year of the um, award, um, we have uh, highlighted uh, the best practices in disease management consistent with the guidelines. And uh, it's a competitive award. Applicants are uh, judged on the published criteria uh, based on the guidelines. Um, and the, the panel consists of national experts from CDC, um, HUD, EPA, and NIH, as well as a uh, representative from the Allergy and Asthma Network and previous winners. Um, and so to win the award, really programs need to coordinate um, all aspects of asthma care. When we're talking about, again, housing, environmental, and clinical care. Um, and uh, some of the benefits of winning the award are national recognition um, through a press release and on EPA's website as well as opportunities to speak um, at conferences as we're, such as we're doing today, and actually really to mentor other programs nationally uh, in order to, again, spread these best practices. So uh, as I said, we're in our 16th year since 2005. We have awarded 48 uh, health plans, healthcare providers, and community programs. And so um, I'd encourage you to uh, visit asthmacommunitynetwork.org. You'll see um, on this map represents all 48 programs, um, and you can learn more about them on asthmacommunitynetwork.org. I'll also make a plug that we will be launching the 2021 competition very soon. So again, I'd encourage you to uh, go to asthmacommunitynetwork.org for more information and to apply. So with that, I'm excited and happy to turn it over um, to our first winner, Michelle Bosworth from University of Texas Health Science Center at Tyler. Thank you so much, Tracy. Um, hey, everybody. I am Dr. Michelle Bosworth. Um, I am a family physician and also the executive director for our Center for Population Health Analytics and Quality Advancement. Um, for the School of Community and Rural Health at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Tyler. So it's quite a mouthful. Um, I am honored um, and on behalf of UTHSET to really receive this award um, from the EPA. Um, as you can see in the slide here, this is actually a picture of our mobile program. And um, these are actually pictures of patients uh, that were actual asthma patients. And one thing about asthma is that you can't tell by looking at any of these children which one has asthma. Um, a little background on um, history of the bus and really how it got started. Um, it really became possible to, uh, due to a very special physician, Dr. Paul Sharkey, who is an allergist immunologist who has been with UTHSET since about 1996. In 1998, he saw a little boy named Wesley who's pictured in the screen here. And Wesley uh, was pretty well controlled with his asthma and was seeing Dr. Sharkey for routine care. Dr. Sharkey liked to throw the football in the hallway in the clinic uh, with his patients to kind of, you know, talk to him about their asthma and, and kind of their breathing and talking while doing a little exercise. Um, so, you know, he felt that things were going well. Um, Wesley did need um, a refill of prescriptions for his inhalers that he was out of. So those handed uh, prescriptions were given to his mom uh, at that time that was before electronic prescriptions. 
um, unbeknownst to Dr. Sharkey, um, you know, Wesley's single mom actually had uh, quite an issue with transportation and, and a barrier uh, for their family and was only actually able to afford getting his medication at the VA pharmacy two hours away from their home. Um, unfortunately, um, she was not able to, to get to that pharmacy and get his inhalers uh, filled that he needed to prevent uh, and kind of stabilize his asthma care. Um, two weeks later, Wesley suffered a fatal asthma and he died. And, um, and that was very devastating to Dr. Sharkey. And, um, and he really, uh, you know, really del delved into this case and, you know, began to realize the barriers he and his family were facing in terms of, you know, transportation and medications and, uh, and really started looking at, you know, what are the barriers to care for a lot of asthma patients that are pediatric patients. Um, so that's where the idea came from um, to, you know, how does he create a program? And he sought funding, you know, over the next few to 10 years trying to write for grants um, to see what he could do um, to program. He got the idea for a mobile program from a conference he attended. Someone else had a mobile program that was delivering care, and he kind of thought that's it. Eventually, about 10 years later, he uh, did receive a HRSA grant, and that in combination with uh, UT funding was able to start Breath of Life mobile asthma program. So this program was designed to circumvent those obstacles that I was talking about that really uh, for delivery of asthma and allergy care. This program performs allergy and asthma testing and treatment as well as spirometry, um, family asthma education, and does environmental assessments um, so that we can understand the triggers in the environment that may worsen the asthma and prevent good asthma control. Um, the team also routinely speaks at asthma symposiums and goes to uh, the independent school districts and gives talks about asthma. On the next slide, you'll see our members. This is actually a picture of our team members. And Dr. Sharkey, I want to point out, is the man in the blue button-down shirt with the tie. Um, and then the rest of the team is our CHW, our nurse practitioner, and our LVN. Dr. Sharkey um, supervises this team clinically. He reviews their difficult cases and helps with the clinical oversight. Um, and, you know, the LVN does a lot of the um, education for the patient and the family, medication reconciliation, inhaler management and education. And our CHW is really a jack of all trades. Not only does he drive us, but he does the scheduling and coordination with the schools and the school nurses. Um, he also helps with um, patients who may be unfunded and helping them get into um, resources or uh, insurance programs that they may actually qualify for. He does basic maintenance on the bus. And that's actually been trained to do our um, home environmental evaluations for patients and their families. Um, especially in our high-risk patients. Our provider is a nurse practitioner, and she performs the uh, exam and develops plans, which are then um, copied and given to the school nurse as well. Um, if the patient does not have a primary care physician, then we really focus on trying to get uh, the patient in with a local PCP or one of our own providers if it's geographically um, feasible. You know, the goal of our program is to really go beyond the traditional healthcare delivery model and bring care to patients while decreasing those barriers to care. We are all aware of the huge impact that social factors have on health outcomes. And our program really aims to decrease some of these barriers by not charging at all for any of the services, including the visits, the testing, we even have sample uh, medications that we give to patients. Um, and, uh, and so it's hundred percent free for these patients, regardless if they have insurance or not. Uh, we limit the need for transportation as the bus goes to the school where the patient is located. Uh, we have even gone to apartment complexes and shopping centers based on the need of our patients. The convenience bus occurs because the bus pulls up to the school parking lot, parent checks the child at school, uh, and just walks over to the bus. We have the visit and then they get to walk the child back to the school. So there's really minimal time uh, where the child is away from school uh, and, and out of the classroom. 
and also that decreases the time the parent may be away from the job setting. Um, our program serves a vulnerable demographic with three quarters of our patients being either government funded or self paid with just under half um, African American, a third Hispanic and a quarter Caucasian. The UT bus along with the expansion of our program with our partner Chris St. Michael in Texarkana, Texas, we see about 2,500 visits annually. Um, during our inaugural year, uh, which was 2008-2009, uh, we went to five schools within two school districts in the Tyler, Texas area. Seven years later, participating in the 1115 waiver, we had an opportunity to expand our mobile program to actually have two mobile programs with our partner, Krista St. Michael, that I mentioned earlier. And uh, this has allowed us to really expand our reach uh, throughout Northeast Texas. And now collectively, we have now been able to reach 50 school districts in a 19 county region. So this program would not be possible um, without um, the school nurses. And um, to illustrate this, there, um, there's a art um, production. I think, go back just a couple slides. Sorry about that. Go back one more. No, I think we're missing it. Sorry. Um, that's okay. So um, this program wouldn't be possible without our school nurses to illustrate the heroic role. Um, there, if many of you may have seen the um, the um, artwork done by Banksy, which really shows a a drawing of a child holding up a nurse instead of a superhero. And so um, and it really just shows that the role that nurses have had, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, and um, and how um, even in this program, our school nurses are really the collaborators and help us with scheduling and identifying patients um, for, for this program. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so the mobile program is important to Northeast Texas because of the disparity in disease burden in our region compared to the state. 14% of children in Northeast Texas have asthma, which is double when compared to the state prevalence of 7%. Northeast Texas is also mostly rural and has fewer primary care providers, unfortunately has some of the worst health outcomes in the state of Texas. Um, and to top it off, we have higher pollution, pollen, and mold exposures, making this especially difficult for asthma patients. I've already mentioned our demographic of our population served. However, a few more key details addressing disparity in that majority of our schools visited are low-income students with respective counties having 30% of their children living in poverty. Our African-American population served by the bus stays within the 40% range, and unfortunately, African-American children in Northeast Texas have three times the normal state rate for hospitalizations when compared to other age or minority groups. We follow the NIH EPR3 guidelines uh, for asthma management and create standard work by having workflows and documentation templates in our EMR to reflect these guidelines. Patients receiving spirometry, classification of their asthma, ACT scoring, and asthma action plans are all part of this management strategy. Uh, instrumental to our asthma care that is provided is the education for medication use, environmental triggers as mentioned, and how to self-monitor and treat themselves with the use of asthma action plans pictured on the screen here. Um, because asthma and environmental triggers go hand in hand, all patients receive allergy testing and treatment as indicated. In the next slide, you'll see uh, an example of what allergy testing does look like if you've ever had before. Um, environmental, service, environmental services were especially important to UT Health Science Center. And it's actually part of our history. So we actually began and housed the Southwest Center for Pediatric Environmental Health beginning in the year 2000 under Dr. Jeff Levine. And this actually was, was funded by the EPA. Um, this was actually eight years prior to us establishing the mobile asthma program. And that, that center had a very special focus in education on environmental asthma triggers. When the mobile asthma 
program began, UT Health Science Center then had a concerted and a broader effort to address these asthma triggers. As such, in our mobile program, we offer a menu of allergy services, environmental assessments, and education, and tobacco cessation delivered by our team and especially by our, our community health worker. Um, and I mentioned earlier about just some standard workflow. This is just a, a quick slide showing our EMR templates um, that helps to standardize the assessments that we do um, for the patients in terms of their asthma care and their uh, environmental assessments. Additionally, uh, we do, uh, on our website, we offer pollen, pollen and mold counts uh, daily so that patients and whoever accesses our website is aware of the air quality uh, and potential exposures that they have that could trigger worsening of their asthma. Additionally, patients can sign up to receive these daily counts electronically. During uh, its first year uh, in the 2008-2009 school year, uh, we had about 144 patients' data that was analyzed, which was about 62% 60, of the patients seen that year. Astoundingly, none of these patients were hospitalized, and they saw a significant improvement um, in a decrease in their missed school days, decrease in ER visits, as well as a decreased use of oral steroid bursts. Later on, uh, from the years 2013 to 2016, uh, we saw around 1,135 unique patients. And out of those patients, 870 of those were diagnosed with asthma. Uh, and, and they had about a mean age of nine years old. So these are fairly young children. Uh, in these children, we saw a 50% reduction in ER visits and a 20% reduction in the school days. This was an overwhelmingly vulnerable uh, population uh, with 74% of them being unfunded. One of the most important things uh, for us is um, to make sure that our patients are, um, are not solely reliant on the mobile asthma program for primary care provider. And we can go to the next slide, please. Therefore, we either connect our patients into our own UT health providers, if geographically appropriate, or local care providers within the community. All of the UT HSCT primary care clinics are NCQA patient-centered medical homes. Our continual goal is to ensure continuity with our primary care providers. This is not their continuity. Next slide. Unfortunately, we all affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, COVID-19 came to the Northeast Texas area in mid-March. And unfortunately, we had to stop um, our mobile asthma. We could uh, really ascertain and, and determine when it would be safe to get it back up and going. Um, so our mobile program became immobile, and we transferred to start using telemedicine visits, which was uh, amazing uh, to be able to still deliver care. We actually had our UT Health Science Center type occupational medicine um, colleagues consult and do an evaluation of the bus and the care, and they made some great recommendations and new procedures for us so that we could deliver care in a very safe, um, environment uh, procedurally for both our staff and our patients. We were able to get our uh, bus back up and running and seeing patients in August. So our program has had a diverse funding background from a HRSA grant, philanthropic donations, and 15 waiver. Along with these, UT Health Science Center has been committed to the sustainability of our mobile program. We want to continue to strengthen our partnerships with primary care providers, as well as with schools through the implementation of a school asthma management program. Additionally, we participated in a recent grant proposal with our UT system partners in El Paso that focuses on strategic and risk stratified scheduling of mobile clinic visits. However, the pandemic has silenced that endeavor for now. Um, so we're hoping that that might uh, get some more, um, more attention soon. Um, we really look forward to continually improving the health outcomes for pediatric asthma patients in Northeast Texas. And I'd like to thank you all for attending uh, this presentation and another special thank you to the EPA for honoring us with this award. Uh, next, we'll be hearing from Melanie Gleason, 
who is our award winner from Colorado. Thank you. Hello, my name is Melanie Gleason. I'm a physician assistant at Children's Hospital Colorado and part of our asthma program. I want to first of all thank the EPA for awarding us with this very meaningful achievement and also for our team for all of the hard work that they put in um, to attain this. It is an honor to be acknowledged alongside the terrific Tyler asthma program that we just heard about. So it's my pleasure to go ahead and to introduce our team and our um, mission here. So this is very important to us and so I'd really like to read it out loud. To provide, our mission is to provide excellent evidence-based care to all families and children with asthma and to coordinate asthma care within our health system, including facilitated transitions of care between primary care providers, specialists, and community partners who achieve the best outcomes for children with asthma. This is our team. It is missing one important member of our team, and I'm sorry I don't have that photo, but it's Bridget Raleigh, who is really the asthma program manager and helps keep us going. And I wanna point out Dr. Monica Federico, who's over to the left in the pink shirt. She is the medical director of this program. So where are our asthma patients seen? We know that the majority of patients are seen in the child health care clinic and adolescent clinics. They're also seen in specialty clinics, including the pulmonary and allergy clinics, the emergency department, unfortunately, as well as outside of our building in schools, daycares, and on sports teams. We know that because they are seen in all of these places, it really was a driving factor for us to understand more about what is going on to make sure that all of the children that we see that we see receive support and quality asthma care. And then who are the patients that we see? So this demonstrates the asthma demographics and it's for both inpatient and outpatient providers and um, we can see that over 50% of our asthma patients are covered through Medicaid. This is different than our overall population at Children's Hospital, and it reflects that the asthma patients we are seeing are under-resourced and overburdened. Also, um, our average patient is about school aged, 40% are Latino, and 50, excuse me, 15% are black. This is our asthma program. Again, it is coordinated by our asthma population health team with the medical director, Monica Federico, and also Joyce Baker is our clinical program coordinator. In an effort to address this um, big problem that we've been seeing with the asthma and to take our patients and care, excuse me, to take care of our patients and their families, we created a comprehensive program and we have asthma champions throughout all of these care areas. They are responsible for helping us to deliver the high quality evidence-based asthma care um, in all of the settings. So no matter where the patients present in our system, they get the same quality of care. This is how we get our high quality care within all of our system. So what we did is we worked across the clinics, disciplines, providers, and hospital care to create a standard pathway and clinical guidelines for asthma that's used both in our inpatient and emergency departments. We also standardized care for our specialty clinics and we work with primary care providers in the community to make sure that our patients are receiving the same messaging and quality of care. In 2008, soon after the EP3 asthma guidelines came out, along with the American Lung Association of Colorado, we developed the Reach the Peak Asthma Educator course and have helped train and prepare hundreds of school nurses, healthcare providers, 
and navigators across the system. We have also worked on our partnerships with other huge care organizations, including Denver Health and Kaiser Permanente, as well as the Pediatric Care Network. And so we wanted to start looking at the data that we were collecting and we developed an asthma registry in 2008. This is um, data that we collect both in our outpatient as well as or especially in the pediatric care network. And what this shows you is that we have been able to reduce since starting collecting this information, we've been able to reduce hospitalizations and emergency room visits. The blue line going down is our Medicaid patients, and that is for emergency room visits, and the orange is for the privately insured. So in both populations, we are seeing a decrease in emergency room visits. Similarly, the lines below in green and purple demonstrate hospitalizations, so decrease for both the Medicaid and the privately insured. So we're really excited about this information. And so we wanted to dig in deeper to make sure that we really are seeing the changes that we hope to make um, with all of this care coordination. In 2012, we decided to dig deeper into our data and really see if we were getting the results that we had hoped for, and especially in the high risk population. We conducted a needs assessment of the kids who had been seen in the emergency room two or more times or had been hospitalized in the last 12 months prior to this um, needs assessment. What we saw is that the high-risk patients were different dem um, demographically than the other patients seen at Children's Hospital and even in our asthma clinics. There was a higher percentage of Medicaid covered patients and higher percentage of Latino patients who were in this high risk category. What we found out is that these patients um, identified barriers to care that we were not able to easily impact through our health care provider visits, even in the high risk clinics. So what we did is we took our program to the patients. And this is one of the two programs that we'll be highlighting today. This is our Just Keep Breathing Home Visiting Program. Um, as you can see in the photo here, two of the ladies to the right are the home visitors, Carmen and Elsie, and they are visiting this young patient who is seen in our clinic and working with the mom to help her to get a better control of this little girl's asthma to understand her medications and to um, just have better overall asthma control. The team is made up of the community health workers who are bilingual. They speak English and Spanish, which is really important in the population that we serve. The medical director is Monica Federico, and the program manager is Kate Johnston, who helps to make sure that all of this runs smoothly. She is a ferocious advocate for the program and making sure that we can um, continue funding it. We also have a full-time nurse who is very important and goes on the first visit with the community health workers. She provides the clinical support for this team as well as clinical support for the children enrolled in the program. And this is what we do in these home visits. So we target children who are between the ages of two and 17 who have high risk asthma Again, having two or more emergency room visits or an inpatient, inpatient hospitalization. The families must be able to speak either English or Spanish and live within 20 miles of the main campus. However, I believe that we will be um, having more laxity with that 20 mile rule as we've been also able to do some virtual meetings with the families. Again, it's conducted by our bilingual staff of healthcare providers and they are really the heart of this. They are the ones who make the connections with the family, really get to understand what is going on with them and to help them to overcome barriers. This is what we do in the home care plan. Um, we have five visits, which are done over six months. 
the first visit is again with the nurse and the community health worker who establish what's going on with the child and their family around asthma, making sure that they have the medications they need, know how to use their medications. If there's any barriers, we identify them at that time and help them to really organize how to manage the asthma. In the subsequent visits, two through five, those visits are led by the community health workers. And so what they do is um, they will complete a home environment assessment using tools developed by this collaboration shown here with our other partners. Um, they also provide tailored asthma education, identify barriers in home remediation. So these are some of the results. This is early on and was really um, the results that we saw after the first two years of the program. We enrolled 49 eligible participants and 94% of those families completed all of the home visits. We identified multiple barriers and this is the, these are the areas that we were able to make a big difference for. So there was a 55.1% improvement in adherence in the participants who we worked with. There was almost a 37% improvement in the parent understanding of asthma, how to give medications and follow the asthma action plan. We also were able to assist with about a quarter of the families um, in reducing environmental triggers. And really it was important to help these families who are managing children who have chronic and sometimes high risk asthma to not only take care of the children with the illness, but also their other family members. And then with COVID, they've had increased stress. And so just helping to support them through all of this. Next slide. The great news about this program is we are definitely seeing improvements in hospital, excuse me, hospital utilization. So the ED visits and hospital admissions decreased for participants who were in the Just Keep Breathing program. And this is depicted in this graph in the gray boxes are the ones who were in the Just Keep Breathing program and the blue boxes are children with comparable asthma severity who did not um, participate in the program. As you can see, utilization decreased for both of them, but significantly more for those who were in the JKB program, and it was sustained six months post participation in the program. All right, and um, this is going to round out our program presentation for today. So in addition to the home visiting program, we are also out in the community with our Colorado Comprehensive School Centered Asthma Program. This is the school program team with Dr. Zeffler, who is the visionary for the program. He along with a um, school nurse manager, Donna Shocks at Denver Public Schools, which is our largest district in Colorado, helped to develop this program. The other members of our team include four asthma counselors. Three of them are bilingual. Our nurse liaison is pictured in the forefront here. And really she is just an example of all of the wonderful nurses that we work with throughout all of the school districts. So we started the program with just one district, 12 schools, and over the years that we've been implementing the program, we have expanded to six school districts in the metropolitan area and including 40 schools where we are currently implementing the program. We also are scaling up to provide care throughout the state through regional hubs. Uh, we could not do any of this without the students and their, and their families who are really our partners and help to inform our program. The school nurses have been a huge support for us and have implemented our Building Bridges program for school nurses. Healthcare providers are always included and it's really that communication with the family, the healthcare provider and school nurses that help to move the needle. We have a population health um, specialist, Arthur McFarland, who's not pictured here, but who has helped our program, especially with population health. And then all of the partners you can see at the bottom here, their logos. We are funded through the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. 
These are our step up asthma program goals. And it's basically to reduce asthma disparities. So we targeted schools that had high poverty rates and children who are at risk for health disparities. The asthma counselors promote asthma management through education. They work with the students three to four times each year to improve their inhaler technique. We work both in the school to reduce triggers inside of the school buildings, as well as tailored um, trigger reduction in the homes when we communicate with the families. We also have really stepped up our efforts to minimize the barriers to care. Um, as Michelle so nicely alluded to in the presentation before mine, we know that the social determinants are, of health are often the drivers of poorly controlled asthma. And we work with children in K through eighth grade. Um, this is Mary Ann Ceballos. She is one of our asthma counselors. And I am showing this to show you the reach that our program has had um, since we started in 2006. So the intensive navigator led program has been implemented in over 60 schools. Um, some of the schools, once they get up and running and the school nurses are taking um, a lead in implementing the program, we have let some of those schools go so that we're currently just in 40. We've also been able to reach over 1600 students um, since our program began as we enroll 150 to 200 each school year. The asthma counselors work with 10 schools each. And as I said before, through um, telehealth and other means, we are hoping to ramp it up to go statewide through regional hubs. These are the social determinants of health that we are screening for. And um, the asthma counselor pictured here is Sheila Morgan, who is one of our asthma counselors. She really loves to be out there with the families doing outreach programs. And um, when we are screening our families, we use a standardized screener that was developed by Children's Hospital Colorado. So that again, we are coordinating our care throughout the system. Most of the patients and participants that we have worked with identify transportation, food insecurities, and access to medications as being their biggest triggers. We're happy to say that when we follow up with the families every three to four months, the referrals that we have been able to make um, have been very well received by the families and 50% um, have followed through on their referrals and linked up with the community resources. And this is um, really our fourth pillar of our asthma school program. We really wanted to focus in on not only helping those children with asthma who are enrolled in our program, but to help all children with asthma and all individuals, frankly, who enter the school buildings to improve the indoor air quality. So we developed a multidisciplinary team and we worked hard to implement the um, indoor air quality program. In 2014, we were awarded by the Regional 8 EPA for our um, efforts in improving indoor air quality and pest management, management and control in particular. We are really excited that Denver Public Schools, who has over 200 schools, school buildings, decided to implement IAQ in their strategies for their Healthy Schools Program 2020. And so this will definitely lead to sustainability. I also want to mention um, at the bottom of the screen here, you will see the Love My Air program, which was a Bloomberg grant given to the Denver Public Health and Environment um, partner that we have. And while we are monitoring and working on the indoor air quality, they are monitoring and working on outdoor air quality. So I think that we have a fantastic um, partnership here and hopefully can help reduce those triggers for our kids, the students, the teachers, and all else who enter the school buildings. And um, this is Christina Colmanero. She was our first asthma counselor that joined our program in 2006. She is working here with a small group of children 
um, they implement the open airways for school program and again follow up three to four times each year assessing asthma control um, communicating with the family and healthcare providers making sure that children know how to use their medications how to minimize exposure to triggers and the great news is that this program has been very successful this is just a snapshot of some of our results but year after year we see decreased utilization in both hospital and ed visits for asthma as well as improved asthma control on the graph here i just want to walk through it so the gray bars are the represent the 12 months before joining into our asthma program and the blue bars are the end of the first year after participating in our program. So as you can see with how asthma hospitalizations, it was decreased from 10% to about 3%. Asthma emergency room visits decreased from around 40% to 12%. And what's really important, not only for us, but for our school partners and our families is that we decrease school absences. So um, when we first began the program with the families, their baseline was that about 20% said they did not miss any school days due to asthma. And after participating in the program, that nearly doubled to approximately 40 um, participants who had not been hospitalized in that 12 month period due to asthma. We also, and this is real important to the kids, see that they are able to be more active and so, um, we see that they um, are able to play the sports that they wanna do and join in other activities that their peers are doing. So overall, this has been a very successful program. It has been a thrill to be a part of it. And we're hoping to again, take it statewide. And finally, um, just as Michelle said, our plans were always to move towards telemedicine because we knew that that would be the way that we could expand our reach throughout our communities. And with COVID, um, one good thing about it, it really did facilitate our advancements to conducting telehealth visits in the schools, in the homes, in patient navigation and through our clinic. I also just wanted to add that our program has also been um, replicated with partners in Hartford, Connecticut. This is for the school-based program as well as Clay County, Florida, and we are working with Newark, New Jersey at this time. So it was a pleasure and, and I really appreciate the opportunity to present our program today. Great, thank you all so much. Uh, thank you, Tracy, Michelle, and Melanie for um, highlighting the programs. And we are gonna move on to um, our final presentation of the day. And that is actually going to be provided by me. Um, I'm Tanya Winters, the president and CEO of Allergy and Asthma Network. And again, we're so excited to continue to host you all this afternoon. We really appreciate you all staying with us late on a Friday in a very long virtual meeting. We know that that is the case. And um, again, we would much rather be together in Phoenix and getting ready to head to a happy hour networking time like we have traditionally done. Um, but today I wanted to wrap up the session and the U.S. Asthma Summit really looking at 2020, GINA, COVID, and what lies ahead in this space. So um, we all know GINA 2019, and, and we've heard about it throughout the day with Dr. Meadows starting off the day and sharing with us some of the key uh, changes in the way that asthma has been managed over time, and definitely in this most unusual year, but the thing that I wanted to draw your attention specifically to that I think is, is most in, important for 2020 and 2021 are the changes in step one and step five of GINA. So uh, again, GINA is uh, uh, the most adopted and accepted global guidelines. Um, in fact, I am a patient reviewer and representing the patient voice on the GINA scientific committee and um, have, an honor, have the honor of, of doing so. And so every single year, GINA is looking at the data, looking at the peer review publications and updating their guidelines. Um, and, and I think that there's no anticipation that that would change in the future. And while we have the uh, anticipation of the NAEPP expert uh, panel update from NIH in 2021, we still don't know exactly when that will be released. 
And as we've discussed before in this community, it's a fairly limited scope of only five questions being addressed. So we at the network and, and most of the experts in the uh, asthma community are now looking to GINA as the gold standard. But as I said, the real two areas that we want to uh, really spend some time and hone in on are the changes at step one and the changes at step five. So at step one, the key here is no longer is there the recommendation for SABA alone. Um, as you can see, uh, SABA is taken as needed across um, all steps, but there is the recommendation of the low-dose ICS or the, the ICS-SABA combination at step one. Now, in the U.S., we don't have this product currently approved and available, an ICS-SABA. So I think that it's important that we, um, you know, think about this in, in the way that the current physician community, provider community will um, actually write prescriptions. So it does present a little bit of a problem for us that right now we don't have those, um, a single option that provides that. But the key here is no longer should patients be prescribed albuterol only. And this is a very important effort that we're going to talk about um, some of the efforts that the network is taking in late 2020 and beyond to really address the overuse uh, and over-reliance on SABA. In fact, uh, today, about half of all asthma patients will only use SABA in the U.S. And we know that overuse of quick relief is actually the number one signal for risk of death in asthma. And so we are going to be coordinating a campaign and really focusing on this uh, new messaging of GINA that does recommend using uh, low-dose controller inhaled corticosteroid uh, formoterol rather than just a SABA alone. And again, this is the more European approach and, and it's called smart therapy. And if you want more information or data about that approach, then certainly reach out to us. We'll be happy to share some of the peer reviewed publications in that area. The other area, and you've heard a bit about it today, is at step five, where uh, we do get into really the phenotyping of the uncontrolled severe patient and where there is the recommendation that no longer should patients uh, be on maintenance OCS, only as a last resort should that be considered. Um, and so really thinking about those side effects of oral corticosteroids and not providing continuous use or maintenance use of OCS until every other treatment option has been exhausted. Um, I, for one, am advocating for the day that we see OCS as a step six, that it is kind of the final step because we hear from patients all the time around the concern and the frustration of the side effects, both short-term and long-term, of oral corticosteroids. And that it really has been the, um, the cornerstone of our work on our OCS overexposed campaign that we have been leading with many of uh, our other advocacy organizations and professional societies, as well as industry partners. So those two key changes at step one and step five are the most notable changes um, in the, the most recent GINA guidelines. Again, we did highlight this last year at the summit, but we wanted to share it once again. Um, we have a peer review publication on a patient charter to improve specifically that severe asthma end of the spectrum, that step five uh, cohort, which we know is about 5 to 10% of the population. However, they do account for greater than 50% of the healthcare dollars that are spent in asthma. So this is a very important group that we need to spend additional time and resources really helping them to get the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. So we uh, published a patient charter, and you can see here where you can access that. Um, I was one of the co-authors on this uh, with an international work group, and it really does highlight exactly what patients should come to expect in, in guidelines-based asthma care, regardless of where they live. And that is a timely, straightforward referral when their disease is no longer effectively managed in primary care. It also is a timely, formal diagnosis of severe asthma 
by an expert team. A team that knows the different phenotypes of asthma is aware of the various uh, unique targeted treatments for those phenotypes and can match that phenotype to the most appropriate treatment um, in a shared decision-making fashion. Principle three, I deserve support to understand my type of severe asthma. Again, this is the, the notion of phenotyping, and we've got wonderful diagnostic tools that now through a blood test, a breath test, you know, you can actually better understand what type of asthma you have and the types of treatments that may be most appropriate for you. Principle four, I deserve care that reduces the impact of my severe asthma on my daily life and improves my overall quality of life. Again, we know that uh, unfortunately this patient community oftentimes is limiting their activities of daily living. As Dr. Meadows said at the outset, um, you know, 30, 40, 50% of patients are, are not doing the very things they would like to do. And so we believe that this principle really addresses the need to, to uh, improve that overall quality of life and activities of daily living score. And then I deserve not to be reliant on oral steroids. This is again, um, a fundamental principle to the charter, but a fundamental principle in the work that we're doing at the network around steroid stewardship. And then finally, I deserve access to consistent quality care, regardless of where I live or where I choose to access it. And this really does speak to our telehealth session today and virtual health and mobile health and, and community health workers home visits. We want to meet patients and people in their lives, in their journey, where they want and desire care to be delivered. And so we believe that this charter document is fundamental to um, setting that expectation and really changing the way in which asthma care is delivered here in the US and across the rest of the world. So this is a um, presentation that the American College of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology asked me to give about the way that patient behaviors have changed pre-COVID and, and during COVID and what may be the next normal as we have um, positioned it at Allergy and Asthma Network. And you know, some things have changed and some things haven't. Uh, it seems as we come up on the end of 2020 that everything has changed. But really when we look at asthma care and allergy care, there are some things that, that existed prior to March and likely may continue to exist if we don't change our treatment approaches. So first, the delay in diagnosis. We know that there's over 60 million patients living with allergies, asthma, and related conditions. And many of these patients are taking years to get the appropriate diagnosis and the level of care that they deserve. Um, OTC, most of these patients are lingering in the over OTC pharmacy aisle, self-diagnosing, self-medicating. Um, and we've even seen that begin to trickle into the space of asthma with the over-the-counter approval and launch of primatine mist and the consideration of over-the-counter albuterol, um, which again, we will be advocating against uh, on, at the network because we do not believe that asthma is an OTC disease that is easily diagnosed or resolved in a matter of seven to 10 working days. Um, in primary care, 80% of asthma patients are seen in primary care. And so, Oftentimes, even before the virus, people were seeking that care only after weeks of unresolved symptoms or perhaps landing themselves in the emergency room or the, the hospital before seeking that care for um, these conditions. Specialty care, the average wait time uh, across the U.S. was greater than six weeks, and there are only about 10,000 asthma specialists in the U.S. today. Now, there are more pulmonologists, but many of them actually do not treat in the community-based setting um, asthma. Uh, they're, they're more focused on other disease states. And so routine care visits, greater than 90% of those visits were in office setting, in brick and mortar buildings. And 10% was less than, uh, telehealth was less than 10% of overall visit volume. There have, were access challenges before COVID. There continue to be access challenges today. We are seeing more and more what we call utilization management tricks. Um, and these are tricks and, and, and techniques by health insurance providers to limit access to care. 
And so whether that be prior authorizations or a policy called fail first or step therapy or things like non-medical switching, there are many different ways in which uh, barriers to getting the right treatment to the right patient at the right time have unfortunately entered into uh, that dynamic of patient care and asthma care. We're seeing greater shift of, of cost to patients, and this is happening through high deductible health plans, through over-the-counter um, you know, switches, as well as through techniques like copay accumulators. And so this is a trend that is very disturbing because we know that as um, those out-of-pocket costs rise, that adherence rates go down. Cost definitely is a factor when patients are choosing care. And then patient engagement really did vary prior to March of 2020. Um, we had done a baseline, what's called patient activation measurement. And historically, it was about 10% of patients that were highly engaged and activated, about 80% of patients that were somewhere in the middle, and about 10% that were very low on their activation score and really feeling very passive in their health outcomes. And of course, you heard it today. Health inequities have existed for a very long time. Um, unfortunately, I think that prior to COVID and the spotlight that's been shown, um, that they were often discounted and really weren't uh, taken as seriously or addressed as uh, aggressively as perhaps we should. Now, what about in the present? What I call the mid-COVID, um, and we, we keep saying the new normal, but it really is the next normal and the next normal and the next normal. Um, we're still seeing delays in diagnosis, still seeing the same in OTC and primary care, but in when COVID hit, all of a sudden those brick and mortar visits went by the wayside. And as you've heard today, up to 50% of patients um, are now being seen, were being seen by telehealth during the COVID uh, lockdowns. And what we have seen too, is that there was delays in routine care. So patients weren't going in for their annual asthma visit. They uh, were, were failing to um, you know, see their physician for their renewals of those medications and those back to school visits or vaccinations. And so there has been a resurgence and a push to rebound there and to get people back into their primary care for their underlying chronic conditions. Specialty care, um, we saw the average wait time actually decrease during COVID. And I think that this is because of telehealth. Uh, but visit volumes also decreased significantly. So we know many allergists and pulmonologists who went from seeing on average of 30, 40 patients a day to only seeing five or 10 at the early point of the pandemic. Um, so again, there have been some decline in overall visit volumes when it comes to specialists in asthma. Routine care visits, again, we've commented on this before, but really this has a lot to do with telehealth and the way that telehealth is reimbursed, as we've discussed today. As long as parity is in place and what you do in person and what you do in telehealth gets paid and reimbursed the same, then we have reason to believe that many, many patients and providers will go uh, the telehealth route, will choose that route. But that is a policy issue that we do have to continue to strive for. Um, continuing to see access challenges, continuing to see greater shifts, but what we have seen is a change in patient engagement. So even here at the network, what we've seen is a more activated, engaged community. Um, we've been doing COVID webinars over this series of, of the last nine months, and we've done 16 webinars with tens and tens of thousands of different unique people coming to these webinars. And our attendance in these sessions has been higher engagement level than we've ever seen at the network. And then, of course, none of us can deny what has happened uh, when it comes to the spotlight that has been shown on health inequities. And really beginning in the June timeframe with the um, George Floyd social injustice that was uh, you know, broadcast around the world, I think that it all brought us uh, really to our knees in, in saying we can no longer deny the systemic racial injustices uh, that are breeding these types of behaviors and unfortunately impacting individuals' health. So these are some of the data around how the visits are rebounding over time, total visits week by week throughout the pandemic. 
um, as well as you know how they are, are trending over eight different age groups. And I'm not going to go into detail. I'll share these slides with you, but I wanted you to have them up for reference because I think it really is um, important that we as public health experts and asthma community experts are out there um, really understanding how people are showing up and, and where they want to have that care delivered. Secondly, this is uh, the, the backup slides on telehealth and the way it's growing. And specifically, if you look on the right-hand side in allergy, immunology, and, and pulmonology, you'll see that in the very recent week, the week of October 4th, that there is very different variations of medical specialties in the percentage of visits that are being conducted over telemedicine. And so um, I, I think that, you know, again, we have to be um, consistent and, and proactive in saying telemedicine is here to stay, and it really is what patients want, and encouraging our allergy and, and um, pulmonology professionals to offer that, as well as family practice and pediatrics. And so again, the backup slides on telemedicine and the fact that larger provider groups are actually using more telemedicine than individual provider groups and the difference of primary care versus specialty once again. But the, the bottom line of this slide on the right is that approximately one third of all organizations actually never adopted telemedicine. And from April to September, we did see organizations shifting from heavy or moderate use to declining back to minimal use. And that may be because in telemedicine visits, as we heard, sometimes you can't bill for the procedures, um, things like allergy testing or spirometry or pheno. And so that may be why um, you know, they're, they're being encouraged to come back into office versus doing telemedicine visits. But the pandemic is not going anywhere, right? And we know that we are going to be in this state uh, for at least the next six months of some level of concern about community spread of the virus. So how do we look forward? What do, at what time frame do we begin to think about post-COVID? And what will care in allergy and asthma look like? Um, these are some of my estimations based off of the readings that I've done and, and different articles from experts. But I believe that we will continue to see some significant delays in diagnosis and treatment. And I really believe that that is just a function of our current healthcare system here in the US. Uh, we need better tools like the AirQ tool implemented in primary care to identify patients that need to be accelerated to specialty care. We need tools like what the Pulsar checklist that Allergy and Asthma Network developed with an expert working group as a quick red flag for patients of when to accelerate care. If that's when they've gone to the ER or the hospital, or when they've had a burst of oral steroids, it should be that time to uh, reassess their treatment plan and demand that care be changed or reevaluated. Um, I think with primary care, you know, we we have seen some numbers that up to 10% of offices may close. Um, greater than 40% of offices have reduced staff in this COVID era. And so will that rebound? Will it come back? Um, and greater than 70% of physician practices have reported lost income. So what is the long-term fallout of this? Will there be fewer people going into medicine? Will the um, financial gain of being a provider be, be lost in a lot of this? Um, and there are some estimates that primary care shortfalls could range between 20,000 and 55,000 by 2033. And then what about in the specialty realm? Um, I think that likewise, there are estimates of uh, uh, around that 10% of offices closing, redu reductions in staff, lost income. But, but what we are seeing is that there could be a shortfall in specialty care of 33,000 to 86,700 physicians by 2033, according to this uh, Washington Post article that really focused on the way that physicians are leaving medicine due to COVID and the changes in healthcare. So this could be very concerning uh, long-term. I think that you know we have to, as a community, stop and take stock in how care is changing and what can we do to support patients in their journey 
and ensure that we're addressing some of these trends. Um, utilization management is not going anywhere. That, that is uh, the case that we hear consistently from health insurance providers. And the, the notion of paying more for premiums and getting less on the benefit side is unlikely to shift dramatically in coming days. Uh, more out-of-pocket costs for patients in the future. But the good news is, is that I do think we will continue to see greater patient engagement and greater patient empowerment. I think we're seeing that shift of more like 20% of patients that are feeling highly empowered, highly activated, taking control of their health outcomes, and only about 10% that are at that lower activation level of feeling very defeated and passive in their health care. And then health inequities. We know that these issues are going to be addressed more systemically. I think that uh, as we have seen um, evidenced in the votes across the nation, um, that people do want change. They want change when it comes to issues like housing, education, environment, um, socioeconomics, poverty, and access to care. And so it will be interesting to see how the Supreme Court takes up the issue of the ACA, how the administration continues to address these issues. We have been encouraged to see the COVID task force efforts um, that have taken place by both the current administration and the Biden future administration um, to see immunologists taking center stage and, and really having nine months of continuous focus on lung health and immune health is unprecedented in our lifetimes. And so I've often said, if now is not the time for allergy and asthma and respiratory care to get the respect that it deserves, to get the resource and the funding that it so desperately needs, I'm not sure when ever will be. And, and I think that takes us as the leaders in this community stepping forth and being willing to encourage our federal decision makers, our state decision makers, and holding payers accountable for the level of care that patients are getting. So again, I spoke about some of our COVID response. This is uh, some of the different ways that we developed a COVID information center. We've got infographics, webinars, um, please visit our, our newly designed allergyasthmanetwork.org website and see the wonderful resources that the team has developed. Um, we do this really for that purpose of making sure that you know that these resources are there. They are free for the most part for patients. And if you as a participant in the U.S. Asthma Summit desire to get our posters or print resources, we will provide those for shipping and handling costs. So please reach out to us um, and, and make those orders. We will, we will be happy to support you in that way. We also have a number of demo inhalers and uh, valve holding chambers. So if you are in need of that in your asthma program, please get in touch with us. And we would be happy to talk with you about the quantities needed and get those resources out to you as well. So I, I wanted to one more time just put a plug in and a reinforcement in for our Not One More Life Trust in Messengers program. Um, we're going to continue to advance this program in 2021. Uh, we are looking at five to 10 cities that we will replicate what we did in Atlanta. And you can see that we've got new branding around this program and that we really do believe that the COVID-19 pandemic, unfortunately, is harming more people of color than other groups in the U.S. And so we've developed our Disparities Information Center. We've worked with Al Keith, a respiratory therapist who's developed um, music education for asthma, COPD, and COVID in employing those tools and resources in um, all of our education initiatives. We've developed new infographics along with the Trusted Messengers um, branding to really get at health inequities and health inequities when it comes to COVID but also to asthma, COPD, and underlying chronic conditions. And we want to partner with you. We, if you're interested in bringing the Not One More Life Trust and Messengers program to your state or to your local community, please email us and, and reach back out um, so that we can begin those discussions of the plans for 2021. As we come up on kind of the end of our time together today, 
the key takeaways for me in looking at 2020 and where we're headed in 2021 is our world is going to be forever changed as a result of this global pandemic. By whom care is accessed, the reason that care is accessed, where they choose to access care, when they choose to access care, how they choose to access care, and even why they choose to access care. And more, you know, oftentimes important is what can we afford to pay for that care? And what we're hoping is the bottom line is patients will be more engaged and more empowered. And providers, although they will be asked to do more with less, will approach patients in a greater shared decision-making fashion and encourage that personal accountability for each and every patient to take power and control over their asthma care. And we believe that that really is gonna be the key moving forward. Um, so when we look at our plans for 2021 and beyond, it includes the release of an OCS steroid stewardship charter in early part in Q1 of next year. We have a COPD charter that will actually be released in November 18th on World COPD Day this year. Um, so a similar docu document to what you saw in severe asthma, but dedicated to COPD given the high degree of overlap between asthma and COPD. And then in 2021, we'll also be looking at hosting respiratory summits. And we're not sure if these will be virtual and if they'll be regional or state by state, but we wanna address some of these key issues that we've talked about. Um, the over-reliance on quick relief, the over-exposure to many patients of systemic steroids, the need to have national action plans or state action plans that are living, breathing documents that are driving change in the most needed areas. So my final sort of charge to you and question to you is, you know, next year when we gather in New Orleans, mark your calendars, November 5th, 2021 um, is the date for the U.S. Asthma Summit 2021. Will you be a witness or will you be an active partner and participant in these efforts to truly end needless death and suffering due to asthma? I believe that it is a committed community of 1,500 people that registered for today's event and well over uh, a third of those that have hung with us throughout the entire day, even late on a Friday. And so I just want to say once again, thank you to each of you. Thank you to each of the individuals who gave of their time and expertise to speak and present today at the U.S. Asthma Summit. And also thanks to our sponsors once again. CDC, Amgen, AstraZeneca, GSK, Myelin, Novartis, and Sanofi Genzyme Regeneron. Without the support of our entire community and without your participation, this event certainly could not happen. As we close, I do wanna remind you that we will be uh, sending out an evaluation after this event. Um, we also will be sending a certificate of completion or attendance for every person who participated in today. We will also send a, a link to the recording of the full U.S. Asthma Summit session with the slides. So you will have access to all of those resources and tools in the coming week. Please complete your evaluation and submit it back to the network. Um, we'll have drawings for Amazon gift cards as a result of participating in that evaluation. And it's your feedback each year that helps this event to get better and better each and every time. Um, again, I hope that next year we will be together in New Orleans and be able to uh, toast to the, the advancement and the changes, the positive changes and impact that our community is making in the millions of lives that are living with allergy, asthma, and related conditions. On behalf of the network, uh, the staff here, Marcella, Sally, all of the team that's been so instrumental in moving this work forward, um, I'm Tanya Winders, the president and CEO, and I wish you all the best to stay well throughout this winter and the COVID period. And please don't hesitate to reach out to the network if we can support your work in any way. Thank you and have a wonderful day.